Hello and uh, welcome to week four. Time to get started. Let me begin the share. Make sure I have the deck open. Let's see. Present. Share. All right, let's see. Audio looks good. Um, let me pull up the uh, speaker notes. Takes it a little while sometimes. I don't know why I have to click it twice um, for the notes to come up. All right. This is week four of information systems security and engineering. And this week's topic is information systems engineering. So let's begin. A well-built information system is designed and engineered, uh, and it's not coming into existence organically from the ground up kind of spontaneously, right? It's designed, it's engineered. This week, we look into legacy designs for information systems, modern reference architectures that are replacing those legacy platforms, configuration management and how to avoid configuration drift, and the essential role that a good asset management system plays at the heart of the practice of information management. Let's see, right about there is probably a good place. Uh, without a good CMDB, uh, configuration management database, uh, filled with device information, network IP addresses, uh, ranges, inventory of software installed on the systems, then the practice of InfoSec is without the solid foundation that it requires. So let's unpack uh, the term information systems engineering. Information and systems are both modifiers of the word engineering. So let's define engineering, shall we? According to Wikipedia, engineering is the use of scientific principles to design and build machines, structures, and other items, including bridges, tunnels, roads, vehicles, and buildings. We touched on the subject of good security design in week two, and we'll return to those principles of design to explore them in more depth today. But we will start by looking at legacy designs before moving on to modern designs for information systems. Let's not assume that we're all holding the same definition of design. What is design exactly? An entire course could be spent on just this one question and topic. Uh, in fact, there are many university programs of study and degrees in design, design thinking, design patterns, and so on. But we'll want to at least state our assumptions about what design is with regard to information systems and application engineering, all with an eye towards information security. Shown here is a photo of a jet engine taken on a tour of KLM's engine services when I lived in Amsterdam and built infrastructure for KLM. Uh, that's certainly a heavily designed and heavily engineered system, a uh, jet engine. All right, let's see some principles of design, some concepts. So what is it, who does it, and why does it matter? A design is a plan or specification for the construction of an object, a system, or a process. Sometimes putting a word in front of another word helps us better understand the word. Some common design titles are graphic design, information design, UX design, uh, which is user experience, uh, product design, and of course, security design. Design begins to matter more as it escapes from the pure utility of function and features into the real uh, world of feelings and emotions. As we examined a bit in week two, brand image is deeply entwined with design and stretches across the spectrum of user experience and touch points. An advertisement, uh, a web page, a call center interaction, uh, sporting event sponsorship, all of these are touch points uh, for uh, design and for marketing. So a little bit further into the concept of design, what is it? For the architecture of buildings, the process is usually quite iterative. Uh, Renzo Piano sketched a design for the Nemo Museum in Amsterdam in 1990. Uh, this is a, a picture of, of that sketch. The construction of Nemo presented uh, the Italian architect Renzo Piano with a major challenge. The museum had to be built on top of a tunnel. The curvature of the tunnel acted as a foundation and was also the inspiration for the curved shape of the building itself. 
in a kind of mathematical mirror image of the traffic descending into the tunnel, the architect designed a building that seems to rise out of the water. Oftentimes a constraint is a blessing for designers. It informs and guides the design choices. Security constraints are also present in legacy infrastructure application, and as we will see, even chip designs. NEMO is a uh, science museum that attracts almost 700,000 visitors each year, making it the eighth most visited museum in the Netherlands. The reason I mentioned NEMO is because the building also housed for a period of time, the world's first MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator, uh, Rabomobile. I designed and built the infrastructure for Rabomobile, uh, a Dutch a project for the Dutch bank, the Rabobank. I'm also familiar with the security constraints which applied to the platform, including the underlying mobile carrier, which changed during the implementation and necessitated a carrier agnostic coding overhead to mitigate the risk of supplier failure or disruption. Uh, it also had a constraint or requirement for LI, uh, lawful interception, and requirements for CDR, call detail records processing and the data retention policy. Um, one of the fun things too about this uh, museum uh, is that the offices are in sort of the bow of the um, building. It looks kind of like, you know, you're looking up at a ship from the waters level here uh, in this photo. And uh, it was, you know, just like a, a you know, spy movie or something, right? You go into the museum, you go past, you know, all the exhibits and you go to a secret elevator and then you take that elevator up into the um, back uh, piece of the, of, the, uh, of the building. And that's where the offices were. I think McKinsey had offices in there before uh, Rabobile took them over. Um, but anyway, this is one of the iconic um, you know, buildings uh, in, in Amsterdam. And the tunnel that it's built over is the tunnel that takes you under the canal uh, right there in the center of the city. All right, what more? Uh, design, who does it? Well, designers, of course. Uh, but the architect role is rarely a single individual's responsibility. Yes, there might be uh, an infrastructure architect. Uh, there might well also be an information architect. And of course, perhaps also an application architect and a security architect. Uh, but there are also product managers, project managers, business stakeholders, and finance teams with inputs and impacts on the overall design. Uh, Johnny Ive of Apple fame is pictured here. The vertical integration of hardware, software design, and security are truly an anachronism in the world of technology uh, because Apple has actually you know, centered uh, a very strong and powerful uh, vertical uh, in the design team uh, that Johnny Ive leads. And they consolidate, like I mentioned, a lot of the hardware and software and design principles. And that's why, at least by some people's opinions, mine included, uh, there's a certain coherence and elegance to an Apple phone uh, that is lacking from OEMs and different types of competitors on Android, uh, which have sort of uh, awkward uh, integration points, you might mention, I might describe it that way. So design, why does it matter? Uh, Meltdown and Spectre are two valuable examples of why design matters with regard to information security. A flaw in the silicon. Uh, technically, the, the flaw had to do with speculative execution, uh, the computer chip design, and of course, Moore's law uh, and power and performance and space, uh, constraints, con constraints on space. Uh, so for example, uh, Spectre and Meltdown was a vulnerability that was found in Intel chips and later on in other manufacturers as well. And speculative execution is uh, uh, the result of trying to make the chips faster, right? Moore's law, um, you know, we have what uh, double the number of transistors and you know um, I think it's 10 times the capacity um, every every year or something or every two years I can't remember the law actually off the top of my head but anyway Moore's law talks about how things become faster and more 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 speedy and one of the ways they did this was to take the logic gates and circuits in the chip and if you had an if condition if a then b uh, or if A, then you know, possibly not B. Uh, the, uh, the chip was actually processing both sides of the conditional, both sides of the if clause, and then later on figuring out which one was needed. And so that made it faster because it didn't have to sort of back up and you know, execute the, uh, um, uh, the conditional. And so this was one of the things that was at the heart of, of the vulnerability in uh, Spectre and Meltdown. 
And the reason this was such a big deal in the security world was because it almost violated uh, some of the fundamental, or did violate the fundamental principle of, of, of computing, which is that user space should not be able to uh, access uh, kernel space or system space. Uh, this is akin to saying water is not wet and the sky is not blue. And the best way to explain uh, some of these uh, problems, uh, because everyone had to go immediately stop what they were doing and start patching uh, and updating uh, the software and the firmware and the bytecode uh, to deal with this vulnerability, because it was actually a flaw in the silicon. So until you started buying chips that didn't have this flaw, uh, you needed to solve a hardware problem in software. And so one of the things we have to do in the world of InfoSec is explain things. Uh, to people uh, that don't necessarily have the technical depth to understand what speculative execution means in, in you know, CPUs and processors. And so I found an analogy uh, that I used successfully at the time. I think it was, what, 2018 or so uh, when this came out. And uh, it helped me uh, explain the complexities of why everyone was freaking out about Spectre and Meltdown. Certainly anyone that was running a hypervisor or a VM. Uh, because it meant that one guest operating system could see what was happening in another guest operating system by traversing the kernel uh, and the um, system space. And uh, this is a no-no, certainly for people operating, you know, uh, on you know, um, shared uh, you know, cloud infrastructure on Amazon and other hosting providers, for example. Um, but uh, anyway, so let me get into the analogy. There's a fast food restaurant analogy. And in this analogy, uh, the heat lamp in the restaurant uh, is a cache. So imagine that you're making a hamburger, you have a hamburger restaurant, you have a drive through window. And sometimes you may be familiar with this, the hamburgers are made before they're ordered and they sit on a heat lamp, you know, during the lunch rush hour, for example. And if you're in the drive through window, let's say your hamburger arrives in 30 seconds, you know it came off the heat lamp cache, but if it took over a minute for them to make your burger, then you know it's potentially uh, made from scratch. And so it's interesting because the heat lamp is like the L2, L1 cache that lives on the computer chip. And this is where the speculative execution was taking place. And so fundamentally, the way of explaining this flaw in the chip that Spectre and Meltdown represented is that you could actually learn what the person in line before you ordered. Right? That's one way of explaining the sort of separation between user space and, of course, kernel space. You don't want that. So it violated the, the principle of privilege separation and processing, kernel space and user space. Uh, like I said, water is not wet. You know, the sky is not blue. These were the things that really freaked people out. It could be mitigated in software, uh, but the performance app impact, uh, depending on the nature of the workload, was fairly significant. I would say 20 to 30 percent of all CPU uh, a reduction by 20 to 30 percent of, of CPU workloads uh, in many cases. Why? Because a lot of these system calls that are making calls to memory and to um, you know user space and, and kernel space uh, via other commands, the uh, the overhead of of checking and making sure that they weren't actually breaking that separation uh, was expensive computationally and took time. And if you're doing it in software, obviously it's going to you know reduce the throughput and uh, performance capability of the hardware. What's interesting, though, is that hardware vendors were made aware of these vulnerabilities in about July of 2017, uh, but it was not disclosed to the public until January of 2018. And so, as I mentioned, analogies and metaphors are very important. Um, it was funny because it was some of the Linux uh, kernel developers that started seeing uh, the fix coming through um, in the early releases uh, of the kernel updates. And so the, you know, the jig was up, as they say. And so in January, they actually had to disclose because people started you know, publicly ruminating as to why uh, this type of code change was coming down the pipe and people started to investigate it. Uh, so anyway, to explain the significance of Meltdown's inspector uh, of the CEO to the board of directors and others in the executive team, there's a need to drop everything and patch. And so I actually use this as an example in some of my uh, job interviews. Even if the person isn't familiar with Spectre and Meltdown, I'll explain it to them. And then I'll ask them to tell me how they would explain it. Let's say I'm on vacation or I'm unavailable and this vulnerability comes out and they have to go to the executive team and say, okay, drop everything. We need everyone all hands on deck. Uh, to start patching and find downloading the different firmware and bytecode updates uh, to fix this vulnerability so that you know your code uh, and your applications uh, would not be vulnerable uh, to potential theft of information. I think uh, Amazon did it for folks that live in the cloud um, and they had a big maintenance window and rebooted the entire universe of, of you know, VMs and EC2 instances. Um, but it was quite a big deal. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why you know, this is the case. But uh, one of the other things had to do with timing. 
and using high resolution timing, you could tell um, on a web browser, for example, uh, whether the information came out of cache or not, or if it had to be computed sort of you know, fresh, like those you know, hamburgers being made from scratch. And this provided certain um, possibilities for attacking uh, web browsers. So the fix for, I think it was Spectre was this one, is that uh, they actually decreased the granularity and resolution, uh, the, the speed of, of resolution and time signatures in the web browsers. So they actually kind of fuzzed um, the high resolution time and made it less um, high resolution uh, in order to allow um, or disallow the, the abuse uh, of, of that special knowledge of knowing some, if something came off of the cache uh, web, in the web browser uh, and in the chip you know, uh, that the web browser is running on. Uh, but anyway, so there's more details on Spectre and Meltdown uh, available on the internet and a write-up about it uh, if you're interested. Uh, next up, I want to talk a little bit about graphic design. Uh, graphic design is the process of visual communication and problem solving through the use of typography, photography, and illustration. The field is considered a subset of visual communication and communication design. Information systems are not just built to contain and record information and data, but of course they are meant to communicate right, and convey that information. Various audiences have varying needs for access to aggregated information and detailed information. So information systems need to accommodate this variance and to provide different screens and views, depending on the user. Uh, Helvetica is a wonderful documentary film about design, actually of, of a font, the, the Helvetica font, from 2007 by Gary Hustwit. Um, and there's a link to it in the, uh, uh, the Wikipedia entry for Helvetica, the film, uh, in the slide notes uh, for the lecture. The film shows that graphic design can be thought of as a dialogue uh, between different voices or camps within the field of communication uh, design. And of course, each has valid criticisms of the other. Uh, the same can be said for cloud architectures and containers and serverless designs. It really only matters whether you design and whether your design and architecture is a liability impeding growth and development, or it's an asset that accelerates growth and development. Uh, let's see what else. Um, so anyway, I highly recommend looking at the film Helvetica. You'd never think that it could be a fascinating and gripping documentary about a font, but the story of Helvetica is quite fascinating, especially because it emerged in Europe um, after World War II as a means of unifying uh, uh, different cultures and uh, different peoples. Uh, so there's a very political aspect to, to Helvetica as well in its birth and uh, propagation. All right, uh, systems engineering, what is it? Who does it? Why does it matter? So we've talked a little bit about engineering. Now let's talk about systems engineering. Security is a design axis uh, along with power, space, and time, right? These are the main constraints uh, that we have to work with in, in systems engineering. How much power does it consume? How much space does the fab or the chip um, take up or the device that you're building up for it? And of course, how much time does it take to perform computations? Uh, security is another access error. It can't actually be treated as a mere add-on over a system like a bolt-on, as it's called, uh, or, or a platform. Systems engineering requires that we look for ways to address the trade-offs of power and privacy and of efficiency and security. Uh, again, that speculative execution piece uh, that was brought in for efficiency and speed in, in Intel chips uh, turned out to be a security flaw. And so we have to make sure that security is not thought of as something that happens later, just like in web design and, and software development life cycles and system development life cycles. Uh, security needs to be a part of the entire process and what are the trade-offs? Um, for example, if you have expensive um, uh, cryptographically robust um, encryption, uh, this takes more power, right? And it takes more battery. And so if you're gonna do full device encryption on a phone, you know, what is the battery life of that phone? Uh, well, how strong is the crypto? If you use weak crypto, then maybe you can get you know, 48 hours out of a battery. If you want to use strong cryptography and protect the data that's on that phone, then you may end up only with 24 or 20 hours worth of battery life. Uh, is that an acceptable uh, trade-off? At least that discussion needs to be happening uh, and it can't just sort of be a secondary or an afterthought. Uh, another thought on, on systems engineering. Uh, for the context of this course, systems engineering is essentially rooted in software engineering, uh, contrasted, of course, with hardware engineering, mechanical engineering, and chemical engineering. A subset of systems engineering would then be information systems engineering, 
Uh, it is a multidisciplinary field involving computer science, business, and architecture. An information systems engineer is involved in building complex systems that collect, process, store, and present data for an organization or business. Software, however, does not wear out uh, like physical parts in its uh, corresponding hardware uh, world uh, with gears and engines and you know, pistons and valves on car engines, for example. The components don't break under stress fractures and they don't experience material fatigue. Uh, so there's no such thing as a, a software library you know, kind of wearing out. Um, it may become less suited for purpose over time uh, as new and better libraries and algorithms uh, are used, uh, but the fundamental usability of the tool and of the software uh, doesn't necessarily go away. So the fundamental economics of software are radically different from that of hardware engineering or chemical engineering. There's no law of conservation of mass or energy involved in software. Unlike matter, data can be duplicated, created, and destroyed. Systems engineering provides the foundation for a disciplined and structured approach to engineering trustworthy, secure systems. And here I put up a uh, photo of the cover page uh, for a NIST uh, special publication, 800-160. If you've never looked at um, NIST, uh, they don't have any kind of regulatory oversight in the world of computers and technology, but they have a massive, massive um, you know, sphere of influence uh, because of the standards that have been written. Uh, it's actually from the US Department of Commerce, right, NIST, uh, and making sure that we know how much a kilogram weighs, uh, what is the speed of light, um, you know, and other sort of standards and technology. And there's a whole group uh, in NIST that's dedicated to, you know, computers and, you know, information systems and, uh, you know, secure engineering. And so I wanted to point out <coughs> that everyone should read NIST um, 800-160. There's volume one and volume two. And one of the authors, uh, Ron Ross, uh, listed on, on this uh, slide. Uh, he has been doing this for many years, I would say 25 or more years. And uh, I'm actually gonna be in a webinar with him uh, next week on Thursday, March 4th. And so I think I sent out an announcement um, asking you to register if you're interested in joining. We're gonna be talking about systemic risk and uh, different aspects of understanding you know, system failure, uh, engineering and some of the you know, interesting components that go into uh, building trustworthy systems. And so uh, this uh, definition of trustworthy uh, requirements for trustworthiness can include, for example, attributes of safety, uh, security, reliability, dependability, performance, resilience, and survivability under a range of potential you know, ab adversity, uh, which comes in the form of disruptions, hazards, and threats. So system security is an emergent property of a system. It's not an actual uh, intrinsic property. This means that the system security results from many things coming together to produce a state or a condition that is, uh, in, in terms of definition in this NIST document, free from asset loss and the resulting loss consequences. Uh, so anyway, there's a link to it in the um, Google site uh, as well and in the lecture notes if you want to take a look at them later. Or just um, go ahead and Google NIST um, SP uh, special publication uh, 800 -160. And I think there'll be an actual update coming to it um, this year as well, uh, uh, extrapolating, um, I think, the NICE framework into the document, uh, which is just a great bit of work you know, to help with structured logical thinking and, and good rigor uh, around systems engineering. Because again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, systems ought not to just sort of spontaneously come together organically on their own, right? There should be an intelligent design to them. Otherwise, um, these complex systems, we don't really understand their behavior and we get rather superstitious about um, how they behave. And it's easy for you know, bad actors to take advantage of that lack of knowledge and make a system do things uh, that it's not supposed to. Um, we need to also talk for a minute about uh, security, system security engineering and the concept of failure. Uh, systems failure with regard to security, they can actually be of one of two kinds. They can be forced or unforced. So with respect to complexity, uncertainty, and security being an emergent property of a system, failure can be defined in terms of the behavior exhibited by the system. The interactions among the elements that compose the system and of course the outcomes produced by the system. 
uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster in 1986, uh, which is this photo here of, of, the, of the spaceship uh, exploding, uh, was an unforced failure. Regardless of the nature of the failure, the results constitute some manner of asset loss with associated adverse consequences. Forced security failures result from malicious activities of individuals with intent to cause harm. So if the shuttle disaster had been caused by somebody tampering with you know, the booster rockets, uh, that would have been you know, a different story. Uh, unforced failures include errors, faults, human errors of omission and commission, as well as incidents and accidents across technology, uh, of course, the human elements of a process or a team, and of course, natural disasters. So in the case of uh, the shuttle disaster, it, it actually suffered from what I would call a cognitive risk. Um, there was this uh, launch is a go mentality. And so even though there were five engineers, uh, one of them, I think his name was Robert Ebeling, uh, who basically understood the data, right? They knew that there had been a cold overnight, um, you know, uh, temperature on the launch pad and that uh, it had reached freezing or near freezing and that the rubber O-rings uh, that helped contain the fuel in the booster rockets uh, had never really tested successfully against freezing temperatures. That's one of the reasons why they launch from Florida uh, and uh, Cape Canaveral in, in, in a warmer climate uh, rather than elsewhere because they wanted to have control over standard temperature and pressure you know, elements uh, for these complex systems. But of course, there was this uh, overriding desire to, well, what are we going to do? We're not going to wait a whole another year to launch, right, and hit another launch window that would come along in April. And so there was this sort of override that had been done by management. And I don't think that it was due to a failure of engineering the process and the approvals. Uh, it was a cognitive risk, meaning it was the perceptions and beliefs uh, and values of the managements uh, in NASA uh, that felt that it was important uh, to continue with the launch even though engineers were saying that there was risk of, of this catastrophe happening. And uh, several engineers did speak up uh, and uh, felt very, um, you know, very much uh, remorseful about their inability to stop the launch uh, for many years uh, after the disaster. Anyway, so cognitive risk plays into this idea of, um, you know, cyber risk, physical risk, information risk, physical risk, um, and of course, systemic risk, uh, which is going to be the the topic of discussion at the webinar. Um, and then uh, on Friday, March 5th, I'll also be doing a podcast talking about uh, systemic risk uh, with um, a deputy CISO, um, Kirsta Arndt uh, from Customers Bank. And we'll be exploring the topic um, next week. Uh, it'll be great fun. I hope you can make both of those uh, events if you can. Uh, so let's see, systems engineering. So we really shouldn't uh, continue talking about it without introducing the concept of resilience. And of course, being a philosopher, I like to define these terms. So what is resilience? Uh, the ability to preserve a secure state uh, despite disruption, at least in the context of, of system security engineering. And I make a quote here from uh, Robert Jordan, uh, who put it very well. He was referencing one of Aesop's fables. The oak fought the wind and was broken. The willow bent when it must and survived. So resilience is sometimes defined as an object's ability to return to its normal shape after being subjected to force or extreme conditions. This expression of the term originates in engineering in, in traditional engineering use cases uh, where the word is associated with tensile strength and uh, certain ductile properties. But it was also introduced in ecology and psychology uh, resilience, where the concept is less concerned with returning to a former state than it is with adapting and coping with extreme conditions and forces. So cyber resilience is a more recent incantation of the term, and can we can do well to understand its uses in other domains, such as education, psychology, ecology, uh, as well as war. Uh, an old Chinese proverb uh, was similar to this Aesop's fable um, statement, a tree that is unbending is easily broken. Uh, originally, this occurred in the religious classic, the Tao Te Ching, uh, with the uh, commentary that the hard and strong will fall, the soft and weak will overcome. The fable, however, is used to deliver different messages actually at different points in time and in different points in time in history, uh, with often when it was first brought out, cowardice was being attributed to the willow uh, at some points in history. Uh, but in general, the lesson learned in modern interpretation and reading of this, of this fable 
is that the willow survives the storm, whereas the mighty oak does not. Uh, another piece of uh, information I wanted to convey around uh, resilience and certainly in system security engineering, this is an emergent property that we want these systems to have. We want things to degrade gracefully. Remember those principles of engineering I spoke about in a previous lecture. Uh, we want atomic, we want things to fail closed in certain situations. Uh, we want reusability, you know, we want um, you know, adaptability. So there are three elements associated with resilience uh, that are worth mentioning, robustness, adaptability and transformability. And a lot of people might actually uh, confuse uh, resilience with just the word robustness. But that still gets back to this earlier um, conception of it simply being a return to normal. Uh, there is no normal, right? There's just this constantly flowing and changing, evolving um, way of being uh, for many things, including you know the internet. And so I think these three elements, uh, it's important uh, to think about them, uh, what is the adaptability of the company, the business, the system that you've built, uh, or that we are supporting and, and protecting? And can it be transformed? Can it be made more resilient based on knowledge of failure states and um, conditions of failure? Uh, certainly under an active attack uh, from an adversary, uh, this is where we actually learn about our adaptability and transformability of a platform. If it's too rigid, um, then it's inflexible and it can't corner, right? People talk about how, you know, certain vehicles um, corner well. <clears throat> and if we're trying to drive an organization or if we're trying to drive a business process, how adaptable and flexible is it to change? But one can also infer a degree of diversity uh, as bringing with it some additional resilience. So take, for example, the potato famine in Ireland. Uh, having more than one kind of crop for starch in the food supply helps that food supply be resilient uh, or robust in the face of extreme conditions. Uh, the analog here for information security would be to have more than one kind of network firewall provider, for example, <clears throat> ensuring that a single vulnerability cannot be exploited to reach deep within an organization if it has more than one vendor in the design, right? You have one vendor firewall at your perimeter, let's say maybe um, you know, a uh, um, Palo Alto, uh, and then further in before you reach your database, you have another firewall potentially. And if you make that a Cisco firewall, then the same vulnerability doesn't get the bad guys through both layers of defense, right? Um, so let's see what else. Um, lastly, a, a sense of time scale has to also be included in our discussions of resilience. Uh, what is resilient within minutes might not appear to last for decades uh, or for vice versa. So if we don't actually agree on the scale of time when talking about resilience and properties of resilience, then we might see forest fires as catastrophes and not as a part of a larger cycle of life, death and rebirth of the forest. Um, could the internet be made more resilient by a massive depopulation event uh, uh, for devices, for example, due to an unchecked ransomware outbreak? Uh, imagine what would happen if there was a virulent you know, and destructive malware that could actually brick and destroy laptops, um, computers and phones and routers and switches. Uh, this would be a, a, like the equivalent of the potato famine, uh, having a massive blight you know, that takes out the entire crop. Uh, could this potentially be a good thing? Uh, could this in terms of resilience on a larger time scale uh, be uh, a good and, 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 and create a, a more resilient internet? Uh, rather than to have all these ransomware events, you know, just sort of eating away and and uh, you know nipping um, at uh, every business and company's uh, um, footprint. Uh, and then I wanted to mention inspiration for these ideas on resilience came from a, a thought piece uh, written by Kelly Shortridge, uh, which you can find um, in the lecture notes, uh, or if you wanted to Google for it. Now it's called the Red Pill of Resilience in Infosec. And she's an eloquent uh, thinker and speaker on these topics. And so I reflect some of her ideas uh, in these slides on, on resilience uh, in, this, uh, in this particular lecture this week. All right, moving on to systems engineering, who does it? Uh, information systems are usually owned by the IT department and operated on behalf of other business units or departments, including information security. Uh, so I may be the stakeholder and owner of uh, a DLP system for data loss prevention uh, or for antivirus, uh, but the actual owners, the technical administrators of it would usually be the IT or IS department. Um, this means that they are 
in most cases, uh, part of a cost center. Um, so the IT department, right, and systems engineering. Uh, what this means is that uh, they do not generate a profit or an income for the business. And as such, there's often a compromise between what is possible versus what is practical. So having a well-staffed and well-run IT department that can allocate sufficient resources to information systems is not actually a given. Uh, there's many situations I've seen where they you know, are starved of, of the resources uh, to implement uh, robust and trustworthy systems. And so it's a compromise between you know, how much security can the organization afford. And that comes down to their ability to understand risk and to gauge you know, how much risk uh, a residual risk uh, the business is willing to live with uh, because they may be aware of vulnerabilities and simply not uh, want to remediate them because they believe that it's too expensive. Um, a lot of organizations, you know, disaster recovery and having a completely fault tolerant set of infrastructure to run on in the event of a regional disaster that would uh, take out a uh, data center is um, part of the uh, you know, calculus there. Um, certainly a lot of startups, you know, don't pay a lot of attention to DR uh, um, to begin with. And I imagine if you think about it, uh, the, the takedown of the social media site parlor for better or for worse, you know, your political views of the people that used it, um, aside, uh, they definitely have to have made a risk register entry that said, what if, you know, um, we get shut down and how can we run our infrastructure somewhere else? I don't think they've come back yet. I think people have gone somewhere else, but anyway, so that's one of those sort of, um, uh, major existential risks you know, that a business needs to take into consideration if they're in the business of doing something that would be considered you know, odious and hateful and potentially brought down by a lot of safety and trust committees, which is what happened when Google and Apple stopped carrying the app. And then Amazon came in and their trust and safety committee said, and we're not going to let you even run the servers. Uh, so I was worried for a while, for example, that people were going to have to jailbreak their phones in order to get the parlor app installed. And then that would just open them up to even further Russian interference, um, which is potentially one of the reasons why parlor was put into existence was to create a propaganda machine and put a bunch of people inside of, um, you know, a, a contained space, you know, an echo chamber um, that was filling them with uh, lies, uh, fear, um, and doubts and uh, disinformation. But anyway, not too much about that, so not to get too political. Um, anyway, so let's see what else. Uh, all HR systems, you know, human resources systems, for example, are information systems. And a good portion of information systems are outsourced, uh, especially if the function is not a core business function for the organization. So in this case, we're talking also about third party risk and how do you mitigate that and how do you maintain control over a system where a lot of your sensitive data is running on a third party platform where you don't have full control and insight and visibility into what's happening there. Uh, systems engineering, why does it matter? In the information age, one could argue that little else matters more. Data is often more valuable than gold or oil. Uh, as the amount of information and data continues to grow and explode, uh, IDC predicts that by the year 2025, the world's data will comprise 175 zettabytes. Uh, this is up from 33 zettabytes uh, currently used uh, when I captured that statistic last year. One of the only real differentiators actually between societies, companies, and communities is in how efficiently and effectively it is able to gain insight from and make equi equitable use of information and data. Uh, let me say that again, because I think it's worth uh, worth repeating. One of the only real differentiators between societies, companies, and communities will be in the future, and certainly in some places now, uh, how efficiently and effectively it is able to gain insight from and make equitable use of information and data. So jumping back to week one, if technology is merely successive waves of democratizing tools and techniques for communication and authorship and the power to publish, then information systems engineering is the application of structures and parameters which enable the free flow of information and data for the empowerment of all. Or if we're not careful, the converse uh, thereof, uh, talking about the surveillance state and some of the dystopian uh, futures that we may have in store for us if we don't uh, maintain vigilance around uh, who owns our data and how our data is shared and how we are, of course, productized and commoditized um, by big technology. 
All right, information systems engineering, looking at the evolution of application engineering architectures. <clears throat> so I'm going to divide this into, I think, what, six different um, stages. So to begin with, you know, we're going to look at the static state. Uh, then we're going to look at client server. Uh, and we're going to focus on the database uh, server tier. Uh, then we're going to look at distributed systems, where the client side suddenly gets more work to do, essentially, right? We have um, fat clients, smart clients, as opposed to thin clients, you know, which was the old um, uh, design for mainframe kind of uh, architectures. Uh, then we're going to look at the connected applications uh, level of maturity, and then uh, service-oriented architecture (SOA). And then finally, uh, what we uh, would call cloud-native or cloud-first, uh, which is you know part of this pendulum that swings essentially between centralized and decentralized compute. And so when you started with static state. You know, that was the, the early days of the internet. There were only a few computers. I think it was, uh, I don't remember who it was. Somebody at IBM, you know, was looking at the computer um, and saying, you know, that eventually, you know, every city might need one. Uh, but of course, there's billions of, of devices now and uh, many, many more computers than just one per city. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the static state. So here my analogy is the library card catalog, right? Uh, it's an information system and a fairly static one at that. Cards were added as new books, magazines, and journals were published. Uh, early mainframe days of computers were usually just merely electronic translations of these static systems with dumb terminals and a back end that contained all of the code. Nothing was running on your VT100 terminal uh, or your 3220. Uh, you know, with those green screens, if you've seen them in movies, in case you haven't seen them in person, uh, some of you being younger than me uh, may not have actually experienced, you know, this transition uh, of these static states, um, early mainframe systems. Uh, but of course, in the presentation layer and business logic and database was all happening in the back end. Nothing was relegated to the front end. And uh, I presume some of you have at least seen card catalogs uh, here, maybe at the NYU uh, in the library, if they still have them or microfiche, things like that. Uh, information systems engineering. So the client server phase uh, introduces some code and some work for the client to perform. Normally, this is the presentation layer uh, data for the user interface, right? The business logic and the actual compute is actually happening in the back end and even in a client server architecture. And so strict control over the real estate, aka the screen size of the client, introduced a degree of compute that can also occur on the client. And from a security point of view, However, nothing critical should be allowed or trusted if it comes from the client, whether that is a fat client or a thin client. Um, all input must be sanitized and scrubbed in order to avoid compromise of the system, uh, a compromise of a user session or of individual data and records. So although it's technically considered a distributed app um, because work has actually moved off of the backend server uh, into the client, it really only accounts uh, you know, um, for the simple designs. Of, of a distributed system. And we'll move on to more distributed in, the, in a minute. Um, but basically the client, you know, is able to calculate, you know, the, um, the density, you know, of the font, if you have a reactive design, responsive design, um, how much, you know, real estate is available on, you know, a screen uh, that's 1024 by 680 uh, versus 4096, you know, um, uh, pixels uh, by 2048 or, you know, um, all sorts of high res displays like 4K you know, and higher uh, require a lot more compute on the client side um, and graphics cards and things like that. But it's not the actual business logic of what's happening. Uh, in terms of the next phase where you reach distributed systems, uh, this would be you know, uh, the advent and rise of the personal computer essentially, um, where people could take commodity x86 compute architecture and create the equivalent of a mainframe <clears throat> or a supercomputer. Uh, and this revolution, you know, this sort of shifting of where the work is happening, uh, you know, was uh, typified by, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer architectures, for example. Uh, so this evolution included things like, you know, MP3 files and Napster in 1999, uh, and further allocation of backend compute resources across multiple servers, characterizing this particular design pattern. So here there's um, a much more equality going on between all of the compute nodes. Uh, and now you have, you know, obviously the rise of uh, grid computing um, using uh, GPUs and building, you know, multiple distributed compute uh, where you don't just have one large monolith uh, with all of the RAM and all of the memory and all of the code, 
uh, you develop uh, things that operate in smaller sharded chunks uh, and you can actually create supercomputers out of um, a bunch of commodity um, you know x86 you know or x64 um, uh, chips and, and architectures it requires a different level and degree of coding and coordination because uh, you don't know what piece of work is being done by which part of the network but it does become more fault tolerant and resistant inherently uh, with the distributed system because you could use lose one of these nodes and the chunk of work, the shard that had been assigned to it, it will just be reproduced by another node later because that payload never came back you know, to the existing scheduler, the job scheduler. So high performance computing, HPC, and grid computing falls under this distributed systems uh, architecture as well. Next up, uh, the connected applications phase. So here, the client device or application is basically talking with multiple APIs and is potentially providing data back into the platform as well. So think of a modern mobile app for navigation like Waze or Google Maps, which is providing sensor data about the location and speed of the client device while simultaneously receiving turn-by-turn -turn instructions from the server and the API based on the desired destination for the trip. So Waze is using your device in your car or on the train or on a bicycle or even just walking uh, to know what the speed is. <coughs> for you um, at that point on the GPS coordinates. And so that's how they're able to detect and use this as crowdsourcing for you know, uh, traffic reports, because uh, you know that there's a bunch of ways enabled apps uh, that are not moving really fast um, on, you know, um, what, uh, I-94, one highway I'm familiar with, you know, in the Midwest, um, Highway 1 in California, the 580, uh, and here in New York, you know, I don't know, what are the highways that uh, run up and down New York? I don't remember them off the top of my head. But anyway, it works in city streets, of course, as well. So not only has the backend platform been distributed across multiple compute engines, uh, as we saw with distributed computing in the prior phase, but now the client is engaged with even more work to be done. So Google Maps is handing off uh, the route uh, to multiple ride sharing apps, for example, like Uber and, and Lyft. And so there's this coordination that's going on on the client side where it's not just a single app, but multiple apps uh, and connected apps uh, that are multi-directional uh, and communicating up and down with the back end. And then we reach uh, connected applications. Uh, another phase of, oh, sorry, I think we just had connected applications, right? Yeah, and so this is another example. Um, another example, this is the WeChat application. Uh, with over 1.2 billion monthly active users, it represents a very real look into the future of mobile computing. Uh, in WeChat, individual applications are subsumed into one platform as mini programs, instead of an ecosystem of connected standalone apps where you launch you know, the Google Maps and you launch Uber and you hand off information between them to plan your routes and then hail a car. Uh, or uh, a lift or a ride or a cab uh, and then it tells you you know and they take that information over and, and take you where you need to go um, these uh, mini programs within one platform wechat allow you to buy a soft drink from a vending machine uh, to hail a ride on a car service transfer money from your account to a friend you know all within the same app uh, all on the same device and so i think that uh, you know because you know, WeChat is much more popular outside of um, North America. I believe that uh, those 1.2 billion monthly active users are living in our future. Um, I can see uh, a consolidation of functionality of apps. I mean, because why does every app need to have its own, you know, libraries and code and for drawing information, right? It, it's just more efficient uh, to have these mini programs running on some eventually consolidated platform. I'm not sure what direction it's going to come from, who's going to win here. Um, and write that new app. It could come from something as simple as gaming. Uh, think of Robux or Roblox um, and their uh, gaming platform. It, you know, out of nowhere is like a $30 billion industry. And it's, uh, it's a hosting platform for mini apps, right? That people write. So I could easily see that kind of thing taking over. I know Facebook was trying to be that platform and to do banking within Facebook and to be able to do NFC, you know, to buy from vending machines and things like Apple Pay. Apple, of course, is always a contender in this area. They could eventually, you know, subsume a lot of functionality uh, through acquisition and just have the ultimate, you know, single collapsed and condensed application experience as well. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. 
Uh, and then after that, uh, I wanted to mention service-oriented architecture. Uh, one of the key ingredients which defines SOA, service-oriented architecture, in software design is the components of applications are communicating with other application components over a message bus. So there are publishers and subscribers, um, think of it as PubSub, uh, and messages are events that trigger actions and reactions. So this is in contrast to what might be called a procedural approach to software design, which has a defined start and an end to the processing of code or data or events. So this evolution of distributed computing it kind of abstracts away any particular application vendor uh, and instead focuses simply on the components themselves and their interactions. Uh, REST, um, RESTful architectures, for example, uh, are client server based. Uh, and those are examples, those are not examples of, of SOA. In SOA, uh, you have this message bus and people you know, set up listeners for specific events. And, you know, for example, I don't know, what would be an SOA design for home automation uh, would be, you know, you arrive at home, uh, the garage door opens, you know, the garage door lock unlocks, you know, the thermostat turns up the temperature, you know, to a comfortable, um, you know, uh, if, if it's in the, uh, if it's in the winter, of course, uh, it raises the heat or turns on the air conditioning if it's in the summer, of course. Um, but anyway, so these would be some of the message bus events, and it's not particularly tied to any particular one vendor. So you have standards of how to, you know, create these message buses so that everyone can participate, and you have this interaction capability between smart home components uh, and things like that. And lastly, we get to this one. This one's kind of hard to read, um, uh, but anyway, it was a beautiful overview. Uh, that I found of cloud native apps um, and which ones are living in a fully cloud native, which ones are sort of cloud shifted or cloud washed uh, and their functionalities and their logos and you know the business that they're in uh, and the area of work that they do uh, in terms of like automation um, and what else, uh, um, container registries, you know, security and compliance tools. So cloud native apps are more about where they are created and deployed than where they run. So fully dynamic, vertically scaling and horizontally scaling as needed. Uh, vertically scaling means you know, uh, a compute node can get more memory. Uh, horizontally scaling means you get two or three more compute nodes added on, each with the same amount of memory that you had before, right? Same spec. So you're scaling out horizontally or vertically. Uh, and all of this can be done potentially dynamically uh, with uh, what are they called? Um, scaling, auto scaling architectures and scaling groups. Uh, one of the distinguishing features of a cloud native architecture is that the applications are what I would call elastic aware. They are notified of their upstream component changes, and they also provide notifications for their downstream components. In the connected applications model, having two database servers in a master slave setup can be transparent to the application layer, uh, which speaks to the database. It might not know if the slave has taken over as primary due to a failure or due to a maintenance window uh, of the master instance. In cloud native applications and architectures, the addition of a third or fourth database node triggered by auto scaling parameters, for example, is handled with full awareness and participation of the application layer. Similarly, the downsizing of the temporarily ballooned resources will perform uh, and will be performed with the application's knowledge and participation. So it'll stop sending requests right to that fourth node if it's um, being drained of connections. So it won't send requests to it. Uh, and that's how it is what we call um, elastic aware. And not all apps have this feature and capability. <clears throat> so a lot of times they need to be rewritten uh, to become cloud native. Uh, so what we're seeing with the advent of containers and Kubernetes, for example, is the furthering of virtualization that VMs, virtual machines, brought to the prior epoch of bare metal servers, where you just had one server and it runs one app and it has one OS and it has one purpose. Uh, VMs brought in, you know, uh, possibility, you know, of, of collapsing and condensing these workloads and, and making more efficient use of the bare metal. But in the olden days, like really olden days, before virtual machines and VMware, uh, first we had hundreds of, of physical servers in, in a server room. And this is what, again, I refer to as bare metal you know, days. The OS runs on the bare metal. There's no hypervisor. There's no intermediating la layers. 
this was not terribly efficient as a lot of the time those hundreds of physical servers were idle and they're not utilizing the memory cpu and disk and space allocated so virtualization allowed several discrete logical layers to run on shared underlying hardware uh, but this actually still contained a degree of waste uh, it had overhead each vm had its own operating system which used a certain percentage of the memory cpu and storage just for the operating system so abstracting away even further, you find that containers, um, they're still logically discrete and separated, but they can be composed fairly rapidly and destroyed just as quickly and allow for greater application density on existing hardware footprints. So let's say that if um, virtualization in VMware and VMs, let's say that they brought the density to 10 to 30 servers per device. Uh, just speaking abstract and generics, you know, obviously you can have very heavy VMs that you can only fit two or three or four of them onto a physical device um, of a certain level of compute and, and storage. Um, but anyway, it, generically, this for po points of uh, discussion here, 10 to 30 servers device, that, that's a really nice efficiency. Um, containers are taking that same device and they're essentially allowing to run hundreds of instances to run at the same time. And then add to that auto scaling and you're now really starting to see real efficiency, right? Full maximum use of your compute, uh, elastic auto scaling compute. So therefore it is however, a criticism of these clusters uh, and whether the complexity of the solution is starting to actually outweigh the benefits. Um, I've often worried that Kubernetes was um, a solution looking for a problem um, and that not a lot of people had this. Um, and there's one other uh, side or anecdote here to, to introduce, which is the whole reason Amazon Web Services came into existence was because they had this compute that they had created for Amazon, right, to be um, an e-commerce site and to survive the, the spike, you know, the peak load of the shopping period in, in November, December. Um, but if you're only using your compute to its fullest extent and, and basically getting return on investment two months out of 12 months of the year, what do you do with those compute resources for the other 10 months? And this is actually one of the accidental, I guess, you know, byproducts of, of Amazon being an e-commerce site that wanted to survive, you know, the shopping, um, you know, season. Uh, is that they decided to build a business around using that compute and letting other people rent it and, and use it during the other 12 months or 10 months of the year. And of course, now it's a major part of the business of, of AWS um, you know, and their uh, cloud services. And, uh, but anyway, it came as a byproduct of, of them just having spare capacity and wondering if they could find a better way you know, to make uh, use of it. Um, Anyway, re reduce, reuse, and recycle. It's actually almost um, one of the tenets of um, environmentalism uh, that drove, obviously they did it for, for profit and to, and to make money off of the hardware that they had purchased that was sitting idle. Um, but this whole reuse concept uh, is much more important than recycling actually. Because uh, recycling, you have to destroy the thing and then build it up again. And there's a lot of um, wasted energy and effort in, in recycling. And I think one of the things the pandemic has taught us under lockdown is that we can reduce our consumption a lot uh, and survive as a society and to do a lot less uh, through you know, disposable consumption-based economics. Uh, now, you, know, you have all these people learning how to make their own bread, right? Uh, that was certainly one of the major themes on my social networks for a while, was people learning how easy it was to make pizza dough and to do homemade pizza and to bake bread at home and to make really high quality, you know, um, you know DIY type, um, you know, uh, um, domestic arts, people learning how to sew and people learning how to garden and having time and, and energy to do it. This also fits in the three R's as well, right? Reduce, reuse, and then eventually recycle. But anyway, um, I'm digressing perhaps a bit much on that. But here the point was uh, virtual machines versus containers. You can see that there's a lot less overhead going on uh, in containers. And so that's how you get your densities to like hundreds of apps uh, running um, in discrete logical workspace uh, on the same physical footprint of the servers that had been running 10 to 30 apps per device or so systems. All right, so now uh, modern reference architecture. So we're done with the legacy. Now that we've looked at the evolution of information systems engineering, let's turn our attention to some examples of what can be considered modern architectures. Uh, without going into the details of any one particular system, we can talk about reference architectures in general. And so I'll be giving you a few examples of those and hopefully not overwhelming you if you haven't done architecture um, and systems architecture before. 
So I think this is a good time check. Um, we're uh, one hour in and a little bit shy of um, halfway through the slides. So that's great. All right, so what are the principles of design um, and information systems engineering that are most relevant to today's business needs? So I'm gonna bring up this slide that I showed you um, earlier in week two, um, the uh, Frank Lloyd Wright um, fundamentals of architecture with his hand um, gestures and positions. Uh, the principles of design, uh, at least from a security point of view, I believe that modern reference architectures should exhibit these properties. Uh, they should be fault tolerant and robust. Uh, they should be scalable, resilient, and self-healing. Uh, they should be segmented in isolated environments. Uh, think of zero trust architectures, for example. Uh, and we'll be talking more about those. Um, maybe we did actually last week already, but um, <clears throat> certainly it comes in as a theme uh, a few times throughout the course. And of course, they need to have evolving and reduction in complexity because the more complex the system is, you know, the more vulnerable and fragile it is. Uh, and of course, we want systems that degrade gracefully instead of just failing completely. Uh, we want them to still function even when they're being attacked. We want them to still function even when certain nodes and uh, redundancies uh, have failed. Uh, think of uh, a RAID array of disks, you know, um, you can have several disks fail in a RAID 5 configuration and the storage volume is still accessible. Uh, and that's what we mean by um, a principle of, of design for, for resilience and uh, fault tolerance. Uh, we want things to be atomic, simple, and modular components so that you can recompose them in different ways and be you know, fleet-footed, turn on a dime, agile with a lowercase a uh, in your business model so that you can reuse and redo um, reintroduce uh, your, your processes in, in novel ways uh, to accommodate the changing environment. Um, I was on a uh, panel discussion with uh, one of the security officers, uh, I think she was an application architect at Ford, and they talked about during the you know lockdown in the beginning days of the pandemic, uh, they converted a lot of their manufacturing process to making respirators and to making masks uh, because they were in short supply. And so that's what I mean when we talk about atomic, simple, and modular components. They were actually taking the rubber coating around windows, you know, for a car, and using that as part of the headband, you know, for the masks uh, that they were producing. Because they had plenty of inventory. No one was in the factory making cars at the time, and so they contributed all of that. And that was the um, part of the wonderful things, you know, that industry put together, you know, to help uh, the uh, frontline care workers that were at most risk. Um, as we were dealing with the early phases of this pandemic. Um, next up, uh, the principle of tightly integrated and loosely coupled. So if it's the other way around, if it's loosely integrated and tightly coupled, uh, it's difficult to swap things out, right? So what you want is loosely coupled, but tightly integrated. So you want a really efficient integration, but you wanna be able to change those couplings. Uh, and so think of you know the different power plugs in Europe and in America and electrical differences. Right. This is a pain, right? We operate on 60 hertz here. And in Europe and in Asia, they operate on 50 hertz. Uh, and so a lot of these transformers and electronics and lamps and laptops need to have the ability to do both. And that increases cost, increases complexity. It's the likelihood of someone plugging something in if they get a physical adapter and they ch you know, change it. You, know, you can burn out the device if you plug it into the wrong kind. And you needed a transformer, not just a physical adapter for the power plug. So that's what I mean by loosely coupled. The ability to swap and keep things you know, on a consistent um, uh, kind of uh, modular uh, design. And of course, um, deliver security in depth, although um, it's interesting, somebody I was talking with recently uh, was pointing out this uh, Swiss cheese model, uh, which kind of pokes a hole, pun intended, in the theory of defense in depth. And so it feels good, it feels right, right? We talk about a defense in depth approach to security and we have perimeter and then we have host-based security and we have network security controls and we have application security layer controls and this feels like it's more secure. But sometimes the complexity that having multiple layers of defense uh, introduces actually doesn't deliver the desired effect. And so I wanted to read up more on that and I'll maybe have to add it into a subsequent lecture later. Um, but I continue to try to you know, evolve uh, the uh, the relevancy uh, to current thinking on some of these soft topics. So anyway, this was a new one for me that defense in depth is a bit of a myth uh, and that there are vulnerabilities that just sort of pass right through all of these things. And I think 
that just basically comes to a criticism that in some regards, we're not really doing security correctly. Uh, oftentimes we do things that feel right and that maybe empirically aren't working. Uh, like all of these breaches and all of these um, you know, hacks uh, that are happening. So maybe we do need to question some of these fundamental assumptions. Maybe that's one of the cognitive risks of InfoSec uh, is that we believe in some of these principles of defense in depth because they sound good, they sound truthy, uh, but maybe they're not uh, in panning out. Uh, and then of course, maintaining the principle of least privilege. I don't think that one's hard to argue. You know, we don't want to go and give root, you know, um, administrator privileges to 100% of the user population. Um, although that was one of the bad ideas uh, that came up on the podcast that I'll be doing next week. Um, they have this, uh, um, what is it? Um, they have this game that they play where you have to submit the best worst idea and you win a $25 Amazon gift certificate uh, if you suggested the best worst idea. Um, so under a discussion of least privilege, we were saying, well, just make everyone super user and you don't have to worry about maintaining the least privilege because everyone has super admin rights. And of course, that's a terrible idea, but sometimes um, it helps jog the brain to think about things, you know, in an absurd kind of, you know, satirical way. Uh, and so that's one of the fun parts. One of the fun parts of that game is, is playing, um, you know, bad ideas and uh, trying to one up each other uh, and make ideas even worse. Um, make sure that everyone uses the same password, password, right? That was another one for you know, hacking, um, you know, um, uh, security. Anyway, and then the last one, of course, trustworthy. And I defined some of those principles earlier uh, from that um, NIST uh, special publication. Uh, so anyway, here's some of the ones to build a common vision and practice within your organization uh, around principles of design uh, for systems engineering and architecture. <clears throat> Next up. Uh, reference architecture. So I want to go through some AWS, Google, Azure, Oracle, and on-prem, um, not necessarily by vendor, but instead to just go through some reference architectures that can be deployed in any of these uh, situations. So I'm not going to be overly um, uh, aligned with any one particular set of terminology, although I may use, you know, auto scaling groups, for example, um, and uh, scaling groups, um, application scaling groups, which are probably AWS laden terminology. But you know that there's equivalent in, in Google, Azure, Oracle's cloud infrastructure, and of course, any on-prem infrastructure you might have. Uh, there are many resources available. Quite a number of them are free, uh, which go into reference architectures for the various cloud service providers. Uh, loosely coupled microservices is the design pattern du jour. Uh, everyone's talking about microservices and micro segmentation. Uh, there's plenty of white papers about best practices with various industries and case studies to be found in the cloud service provider documentation. Uh, with tools like Terraform and cloud formations, uh, the ability to deploy multi server blueprints is increasingly easy. Uh, it's not possible to dive into more than just a few of these reference architectures right now during this lecture, but mentioning a few of them will be helpful to make a few points. Shown here is the cover of uh, Christopher Alexander's 1977 book, A Pattern Language on Architecture and Urban Design, published by the Center for Environmental Structure of Berkeley, California. The term was coined by Alexander, uh, Pattern Language, and his book is still one of the principal texts used in teaching architecture to this day. And by that, I mean, you know, like the arches and the building uh, and campus and physical architecture, right? Not uh, information architecture, but there are corollaries. And so I think uh, this is actually, you know, a, an interesting way of uh, cross uh, pollinating, you know, our cyber uh, research and education by reading about uh, a pattern language uh, by Christopher Alexander, uh, a seminal work uh, in, the, in the field. All right, so what do we have here? Uh, we have the basic web application architecture uh, needs to cover these basics, right? Um, DNS can be dynamic or static. Uh, load balancers uh, can be using round robin uh, as their algorithm, uh, which means just bouncing one connection after the other to all of the nodes, uh, or it can use least cons, uh, least connections. So send the request to the node that has the least number of connections. Uh, it can also use sticky sessions. So once your request is bound to a particular node, you don't want to have to replicate your session data to multiple nodes. And so you could be bound uh, through the load balancer to be sticky to one particular node. And there's other algorithms and, and techniques uh, for load balancing as well. Uh, an application as shown here can be a web app pair, or it can be a standalone application server instance or container. 
uh, and the database uh, could have some traffic, you know, in going to a slave. Uh, you could have read only slaves that are used to offload the master uh, so that it doesn't have to be too, you know, spec uh, too large uh, of an instance. And so these are, you know, some of the basics, um, just a typical example of, of, you know, a cloud architecture. This could be, of course, performed inside of a data center as well. It doesn't have to be in cloud. Um, another architecture reference, uh, this entire setup can be replicated across two or more availability zones or data centers. And uh, database replication can be application-based or storage-based. So if you need to replicate the data that might be happening on one side or the other of this design, uh, you can do that replication through the app, let's say an Oracle database, and it ships those um, commits and logs and changes off to its uh, sister side of the architecture. Uh, or it could be done on the storage side where the database, the Oracle database in my example, doesn't even know that what's being written to the storage devices and to the file systems uh, is being replicated you know, at a storage layer level uh, to the other side. And that way reads and writes um, can you know, be um, shared across you know, whatever's happening. This is like an active, active twin data center architecture. And each one of these could be you know, within US East so you could have US East 1A and US East 1B. I think US East is comprised of you know, A through F. Um, uh, and those are discrete data centers with um, different fault tolerant capabilities in terms of generators and failover and replication of, of, of your instances that are running there. Um, but you still have to pay attention to it. The cloud doesn't magically make it highly available. Uh, you can have concentration risk in the cloud uh, where you could have all of your nodes running in one availability zone and a hurricane comes in and wipes out that data center. Um, you yourself are responsible for making sure that you have at least some of your nodes running in another AZ. And of course, this will help these kinds of architectures help support higher RPO and RTO. Um, RPO is um, recovery point objective. So how much data can you afford to lose in the event of a failure? And then RTO, uh, recovery time objective. Uh, how much time does it take to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? So let's say that we lost you know, um, an entire half of one of these infrastructure. Whatever commits hadn't been backed up and replicated to the other side for the storage, for the transactions, for example, would be your number that determines your recovery point objective. So if you're replicating your storage off once a night and you're just doing a, a dump on each side and shoveling the backups you know, to, the other, to the other node, your recovery point objective is gonna be 24 hours. That's the maximum amount of data that could be lost in the event of a failure of one of these nodes or one of these data centers um, if it happened at an inopportune time, right? Like the backup had just occurred and it started writing and 23 hours and you know, 59 minutes later, boom, it crashes. You lose 23 hours and 59 minutes of data because the backup hadn't happened yet. Uh, so that's where the recovery point objective comes from. And then in terms of recovery time, really it's a matter of technique. Do you restore from a backup or do you just simply deploy fresh uh, and use infrastructure as code, deploy with a Terraform plan, build out your entire, you know, AZ, a multi-server blueprint of web server, you know, database, storage, you know, networking and all those configs, and then rehydrate it with the data from your existing node. Um, anyway, so the backup and restore technique isn't always um, the fastest. You can have a faster RTO if you uh, put in the effort to do infrastructure as code, the ability to deploy multi-server blueprints uh, from a Git repo using a Terraform plan uh, and stand up that infrastructure within a few minutes. Um, that for me is a bit of the holy grail for high availability and fault tolerance uh, because then you know, it can take you longer than 15 minutes just to figure out what backup you, know, uh, you want to restore and then begin the restore of that data. You still need a server to, de to restore it into and it could take you know um, days or weeks, you know, if it's terabytes and terabytes of data and your you know, storage device that the backups are on are slow. Um, but anyway, so those are some of the factors to consider in this example of um, a two or more uh, availability zones. Um, next up, let's jump into another AWS example. But again, you know, none of these are particularly vendor, you know, proprietary solutions. Uh, the same fundamental concept can be achieved in other cloud service providers. Um, actually, I'm going to go through three examples that illustrate a point about redundancy and fault tolerance in design of, of information systems. So in this case, an ELB. Uh, is an elastic load balancer, uh, which is now I think called a classic load balancer. 
Um, some of them are you know, simple load balancers, and that's what they mean by classic. Uh, and then they have network load balancers, which are you know, more of a layer seven uh, implementation. The other acronym in here is an ASG, an auto scaling group. Uh, so I've got two ASGs in here. And we have backend one and we have backend two, and they're fronted by one ELB, right? And so the auto scaling group, like I said, can balloon and contract as needed uh, to handle. And you could have backend one could be the main part of a website. And backend two could be the content and the web uh, pages for a signed in user. Uh, so you could have a, most of your traffic going to backend one, right? It doesn't have to be evenly distributed. It could be functionally distributed, uh, which means the user hasn't logged in yet. So they're looking at the about page. They're looking at the contact, you know, the product and services and the blog posts. Um, but then once they sign in and you start having, you know, account information and dynamic content, that could be totally routed through the ELB uh, to a second backend auto scaling group. Uh, another reference architecture building on the same design then would be to put a proxy uh, or a caching load balancer in front of your in front of your ELBs. So I think of Nginx um, as a, a great tool that's been around for a long time. I think they got bought by F5 uh, for about $670 million uh, recently. Uh, but anyway, so F5 was in the business of on-prem you know, load balancers. Now they're doing web-based and uh, virtual load balancers. So buying Nginx was a really good idea because it's a very powerful, um, uh, widely used um, caching proxy that might go in front of you know, an Apache web server or um, an open RESTE server or something like that. And of course, you can have advanced features inside of this caching proxy. Uh, it can have WAF uh, rules, uh, web application firewall rules that operate on layer seven uh, to protect your backend infrastructure. Uh, it can also do ETL, um, uh, extraction, transformation, and loading, uh, and transform the data on its way to the backend so that you can potentially run legacy stacks on your auto scaling group and yet still present a modern API on the front end or a modern web presence uh, and combine legacy information with uh, new refactored uh, code written in, in uh, different uh, languages uh, with different uh, features. And you can use the proxy and caching server to do that. Um, the ALB uh, uh, is introduced here, I think, as well. I think I talk about that. Let me just double check. Um, well, those are those two nodes um, after the Nginx, right, which is in green. Uh, those could be ELBs or ALBs. And so the application load balancer, this is your layer seven AWS improved load balancer over the classic load balancer, which just basically does port and protocol, uh, port 80 and 443. And then of course you have your auto scaling group and your backend, like I mentioned for login pages, uh, logged in users and unlogged in users content and pages. Uh, and then the, here's a variant on this as well. In this design, it's a bit more work to implement, but it provides a fault tolerant variation on the previous design um, because you have multiple Nginx instances now. Uh, so each one of these is using the ASG API to know how many backend nodes are in service at any given point in time. All right, um, now let's take a look at the CI CD pipeline. So con continuous integration uh, and con continuous uh, deployment. Um, this is the you know, four letter acronym, I guess, CICD, uh, that's used to describe uh, what a very modern uh, reference architecture might look like. Uh, the source for this was actually Walmart. Uh, and Walmart is funny because they, um, they have this uh, love of writing code in F sharp. And uh, I've not seen a lot of people that do that. Or at least a couple of years ago, uh, when I was um, looking at, uh, at Walmart and uh, their infrastructure and talking with folks uh, about their security and tooling and how they did things, um, they have a, uh, um, a blog post and case studies. And you'd be surprised actually at how advanced um, Walmart's uh, web team has become. And so let's uh, take a look at this real quick um, before I go too far. Uh, so you have your code push in the upper left hand corner from a developer working on a workstation, you know, they have this like tower kind of drawn there um, with uh, with a monitor. They push it into Git. Um, that's that cat with the blue circle around it, uh, which triggers a build. Uh, and then they have a build pipeline. The build pipeline then downloads the source code 
um, you uh, build uh, the packages, uh, unit testing occurs, static code analysis, where it's scanning it to make sure it's using the latest stable um, and secure versions. And if it finds that the developer was working with, you know, let's say an embedded Tomcat server or an embedded database, you know, components or something, that's when they would be warned saying, no, you need to go get, you know, version 4.5 or Tomcat 9.8 or something. And that would then allow them to iterate uh, in the lower environments, right? Uh, even before it reaches uh, dev stage, you know, or QA uh, or shared environments um, uh, that are used before production, of course. So you're getting a lot of this, um, what's called shift left mentality, where security functions um, are less expensive to perform earlier in the release street, right? And the release street shown here would be going from dev to QA to staging to production. And uh, the more security you can implement in the lower environments, the less expensive it is uh, and less disruptive to building the code. It can cost, you know, human time and testing time a lot less. Anyway, so you do a static code analysis. You do security analysis as well to look for OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, you know, CIS controls on the configurations. Uh, you do dependency checks. Uh, you build a Docker image, or at least they build a Docker image because I took this off of their blog. And they push that Docker image to a registry. All right, so now we jump back up to the top and we have this cube, which is a container registry of a component that's being used, right? And remember containers are just sort of hyper virtualized, you know, um, VMs essentially without an OS attached. Uh, they run on an OS. So anyway, that triggers a deployment pipeline, um, which then goes into dev and then QA and staging. And, you know, things get promoted from dev to staging. You have QA teams come in and, and run their tests. Uh, you have integration tests running at the staging level, uh, at the QA level. Uh, then you have load tests that could run to make sure that it doesn't fall over when there's you know, 10,000 concurrent connections and things like that. So it downloads that Docker image, that container. It deploys to that environment, runs the load test, pushes the image up. And now we're back into the container registry, but now we're in the production registry. So this would be like an artifact repository of the container image. And then finally you deploy to prod and then it goes to multiple nodes and it's behind the load balancer. And so there's only a couple of manual process steps in here um, and the rest of it should be automated, right? Uh, you don't want things being promoted all the way through to production unless you're really confident in your testing and the scope of your you know, unit testing, smoke testing, integration testing, security testing. You can even have um, some automated pen testing uh, features and functionality uh, built into this kind of a release street. And so there you have um, a high level overview of a modern architecture of CICD, uh, thanks to um, Walmart. All right, now it's time to turn and talk about configuration management and drift. Configuration management tools enable changes and deployments to be faster, repeatable, scalable, predictable, and able to maintain the desired state, which brings controlled assets into an expected state. IAC, Infrastructure as Code, allows teams to leverage development best practices such as version control, testing, you know, small deployments uh, that happen more frequently, and uh, repeatable design patterns. So configuration management, um, what are the benefits, some of the tools, and, and what does it look like in practice? Uh, while this graphic was taken from a software testing article, the lifecycle does apply to hardware lifecycle as well. So the idea of infrastructure is code and to have software and the corresponding infrastructure load balancers, firewalls, virtual switches, etc., all being able to be committed to a repository and deployed as a complete set. That's what makes it possible to manage software and its dependencies much more rigorously than ever before. So you have storage, network, compute, and code. They're, they're all converging, essentially. Uh, indeed, the term hyper-converged infrastructure is a real term. And there are companies that work on building hyper-converged um, components where you have storage and network and compute, you know, coming in in these sort of fundamental um, blobs or, or um, pods. Uh, DevOps is just one wave of that collapsing of roles and responsibilities, um, where you previously may have had an operator and a developer, and you know the developer throws it over the fence, and the operator then deploys it and maintains it and supports it. Now you know, that's collapsing. So DevOps and DevSecOps. Uh, is basically this hyper-converged roles where you no longer have um, a network admin, a storage admin, and a database admin. Uh, you have somebody 
who knows enough to be dangerous in, in all three areas. Uh, let's see, release management can also be, um, can build clones uh, of entire multi-server blueprints uh, when you do infrastructure as code. Uh, where one component, you know, maybe a developer wants to swap out the database and say, I want to try using a Postgres database. And so, you know, you kind of clone uh, and then swap out one component. And uh, this is almost relegated to self-service um, in some of these cases, where you can just simply define in your, um, uh, in your Terraform plan uh, that you want to deploy you know, a different type of AMI or a different type of container and you end up swapping out um, a MySQL database with a Postgres uh, or an Oracle database with a Postgres database and things like that. And of course you can have a la carte design patterns can be provisioned as well uh, where you just mix and match and you're building something entirely novel and, and new uh, for uh, your, your team. And of course, these phases are all quite well known, you know, analysis and design phase, implementation, testing, releasing, maintaining, uh, and then the planning and specifications go back into it and it feeds back uh, into a loop uh, as you iterate and improve on the designs. Uh, configuration management um, benefits. One of the benefits is adherence to coding conventions that make it easier to navigate code. You know, if you're doing configuration management, you may be using something like um, Ansible or Puppet or Chef, uh, and uh, it allows you to use coding conventions. It just makes it a lot easier for people to join the team and know what someone's doing, rather than to have to follow like a, you know, a seldom updated Word document that says, this is how we build a server, right? The idea is the difference between cattle and pets. Infrastructure should be treated as cattle. And I apologize to any vegetarians, um, in the class that uh, maybe take objection to, to eating meat. But the idea in this uh, example is that, you know, you shouldn't treat your infrastructure like a pet. It shouldn't have a personal name. You shouldn't get attached to it uh, because that becomes a security risk. Uh, these uh, pets that are grown and built up are often also referred to as snowflake computers. Uh, they're not identical. And configuration management is a means of enforcing through technique and code uh, identical, replaceable, you know, uh, consistent builds of application components for multi-server blueprints, for example. Um, idempotency is another term to bring up here, uh, which means that the end state remains the same no matter how many times the code is executed. So you can hit the build button, you know, 100 times and you don't end up with some kind of broken build. Uh, idempotency is one of the benefits of configuration management. If it says, oh, I already have this installed, so I'm not going to spend the time to reinstall it. Um, you have this sort of awareness of what the blueprint is of what you're building. And, you know, the agent or the code that's doing this, your configuration management tool is smart enough to know whether it needs to perform a particular test or step. And if it tests to say, okay, there's already a MySQL database configured, I'm going to go ahead and configure the Tomcat data you know, application server that talks to it. Um, you can also wait for that to come into existence, or it can build it, it would fail, and then eventually you reach what's called eventual consistency. Um, anyway, idempotency just means you can repeat things over and over. And that's an aspect of coding that requires a certain level of discipline as infrastructure and as security. Uh, practitioners, we want to make sure that the IS and the DevOps team and the server reliability engineers, SREs, are all following these best practices because then our job becomes much easier. Uh, and then, of course, um, distributed design uh, to improve managing large numbers of remote servers, right? If you're going to have hundreds of elastic scaling, auto scaling compute nodes, you want them to be identical, right? You don't want someone to, you know, have um, 101 Dalmatians, which are all different. And then, of course, some of the tools um, that are associated with configuration management. Uh, CF Engine, Puppet, Ansible, Chef, and Blade Logic. Uh, this is not uh, all tools, um, but it's a good list. Uh, there are others. Uh, most of these are agent-based, uh, meaning they have an agent that is sitting and running on the container or on the VM. Ansible, however, is agentless, and it's actually one of my favorites. While it's possible to use any of these tools and to get mature and sophisticated with your management of infrastructure and applications and code and thereby the security, um, the beauty of Ansible is that it contains aspects of orchestration as well as configuration management. And those two are not the same. Um, like I mentioned um, a moment ago, that some things sort of come together in a particular order 
uh, with Ansible playbooks. Whereas in other systems, the desired state uh, obtains of eventually, uh, but perhaps not in the order in which you liked it. Uh, so Puppet, for example, you know, can go out and just everyone starts you know, to build and all the agents start saying, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna you know, build the database and I'm gonna build the web server. I'm gonna build the storage. I'm gonna build the network load balancer and populate it with rules. They might not come together in a logical sequence but they'll keep iterating, showing that some of their tests fail and uh, retrying and rerunning certain steps. That's why idempotency is needed. Um, and so maybe after 20 or 30 runs of a puppet um, engine or a puppet agent on a host, uh, it'll eventually come back and say, green, all the conditions I need uh, to be a functioning multi-server blueprint have now obtained as true. Um, everything checks out and you have a functioning app, right? Or container or web instance. Um, but what I like a lot about Ansible is that it kind of gives you a chance to say, do this first, do this second, do this third. And that's the orchestration component uh, of Ansible as a configuration management tool. And so it kind of allows you to not stumble along and haphazardly build infrastructure that then eventually reach desired state. So given, given my, my druthers um, in a, a situation where I'm allowed to, dis, to, to, to define and suggest what to use, I'd go with Ansible. Um, and I think we'll talk about, or I'm going to talk about each one a little bit in depth uh, for the next couple of slides. All right, um, what else? Uh, CF Engine. Uh, so CF Engine, uh, it's been around forever. Uh, started out in early days, 1993. <clears throat> CF Engine 3 uh, came out in 2008, um, but it was a big change uh, after you know, about five years of, of research. So between 2003 and 2008, <clears throat> the switching costs for many devotees of CF Engine uh, were greatly uh, reduced at that point because it was a major rewrite. So what does switching cost mean? Uh, if you switch from something that you're addicted to, right, um, that you just love and you're very familiar with it, the switching cost is high because you're going to learn something new and, and you have to learn new ways of doing something. Um, but when the switching costs get high enough uh, within a particular tool like CF Engine going to this object-based approach uh, with CF Engine 3, it was radically different enough from CF Engine 2 that a lot of people said, well, wait a minute, I may want to switch horses now and start doing, you know, Puppet or Ansible or something because they've come along uh, in a long ways and CF Engine may have been your go-to configuration management tool. Uh, but at that point, you know, it was such a radical rewrite uh, that a lot of people switched, uh, a lot of us actually, I know I did when I was working in Europe at the time, uh, we, we stopped using CF Engine, didn't want to have to go through the learning curve of, of redoing everything in CF Engine 3. So we switched to using Chef and Puppet and gave them a try. Um, and they were up and coming and they had young, vibrant communities springing up around them. And so now, you know, there's certainly um, active communities of, of configuration management, um, you know, uh, developers and supporters and community additions. You don't always have to get a, a commercially supported version, but they do exist. Um, Puppet Labs, for example, does Puppet. Um, but anyway, so that's one of the things I wanted to mention, switching costs, um, because when the barrier to switching uh, becomes high enough uh, for a tool, that's when you can make radical changes, right? Um, or you can potentially affect a good cost savings um, by switching away from an expensive tool like Oracle and going to a now completely comparable in many ways, open source and free tool like Postgres. Um, but anyway, I don't wanna get people at Oracle angry at me. Oracle is great for many things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Puppet. Uh, Puppet is a lot like CF Engine in that its, its statements are what are called convergent operators. Uh, they are idempotent, which means they can be repeated without worry, uh, and they're declarative. But if they're not ordered properly, it might take, like I said, a few iterations of the Puppet agent to get to the desired state. Puppet has facts on the agent servers and it has manifests that live on the central server. The combination of these two kind of make things happen. So I like to think of the difference between Puppet with manifests and Chef, which uses things called recipes, um, as to how you would order a cup of tea on board the Starship Enterprise if the replicator were puppet-based versus chef-based. Uh, so tea, Earl Grey, hot. Um, that's the way in my you know, Patrick Stewart uh, impersonation. Uh, that's basically the puppet instruction. The chef equivalent would be you know, bring water to boil, insert Earl Grey tea bag, steep for a minute, 
then remove tea bag, right? And thus it's based on the recipe metaphor. Uh, so for me, that's the philosopher's way of explaining the difference between chef and puppet using a geeky Star Trek reference uh, for the replicator uh, to make a cup of tea. Uh, for Ansible, as I mentioned, given my druthers, I would pick it uh, if you're starting from scratch because there is no agent, um, which is easier to maintain actually, because then you don't have to worry about upgrading agents. Uh, the markup used for the language uh, is YAML, uh, which is an acronym for yet another markup language. Uh, but YAML is, uh, for Ansible, is actually human readable, as well as, of course, being machine readable. Uh, Puppet and Chef are a lot less uh, amenable to human reading and understanding what's going on in them, uh, but just by looking at them. And it just makes things come together better. Um, there are certainly reasons to choose Puppet or Chef over Ansible in various industries. And based on your server mix, uh, Windows plus Chef and PowerShell uh, is a great combination, for example. <coughs> Microsoft got on board with using Chef and PowerShell to manage and make consistent state uh, for Windows machines. Because remember, before PowerShell came along, a lot of Windows stuff had to be done through dialog boxes and through a UI and clicks and, and tabs. You know, And now that PowerShell is there, it's all command line based. Uh, so you can have the complete control over a Windows OS configuration. And actually, you get more control out of PowerShell than you do out of the GUIs. Um, if you're administering Exchange, for example, there's more control and fine-grained controls through PowerShell configuration of, of, of Exchange than through the actual old-fashioned you know, dialog boxes of, of pulling up you know, the Exchange management window and control panels. Um, anyway, so that's also what else. Uh, but in a general, uh, this solution uh, is robust, actively supported with a community of users and developers that's not going to go away. Uh, Ansible was bought by Red Hat. Red Hat is now owned by IBM. I can't imagine any of these uh, investments in, in Ansible as a configuration management tool uh, would be um, you know, wasted effort uh, for you know, many years into the future. Uh, configuration management tools for Chef. Um, a major boost, uh, like I said, was received when Microsoft combined it with PowerShell to create DSC, uh, Desired State Configuration. Uh, in 2014, this was a big deal. Uh, and it's still a big deal, actually. Like I said, PowerShell is awesome. Uh, and uh, a little trivia uh, to mention here, before PowerShell came out, it had a project code name, and that code name was Monad, M-O-N-A-D, which comes from, uh, I think, a Spinoza, um, if I remember correctly, um, philosophy of uh, being. Uh, so that's one of my connections with philosophy and computers, and, and uh, Monad being the project name for PowerShell at Microsoft. Anyway, so it leverages Chef to help maintain state on Windows computers and servers. And it was such a smart move um, by the new leadership in, in Redmond. Uh, I also want to give a mention to Blade Logic. Uh, Blade Logic has been in this business for a long, long time. And it's interesting. Um, I once asked uh, BMC executives uh, in a briefing in Texas, uh, at an executive briefing in Texas, where they had flown me out to show me all the things that they were working on. And I, um, I asked them, what will disrupt Blade Logic and BMC? And after some genuine consideration of the question, they replied, commodity compute. Uh, their reason for being, the reason for Blade Logic's being and for BMC's being, is to help solve the diversity of so many companies' back ends uh, and middle office and front office platforms and solutions, ranging from mainframes to legacy PCs uh, to modern cloud compute. Uh, so how to glue it all together ought to be a dying art. But until that day comes, when compute and network and storage are like electricity and water, it's just a commodity, you flip a switch and, and there it goes, uh, then BMC and Blade Logic still have a business model that will keep them going. Now, they are uh, and were working on making it easier to run their software uh, without having to get a PhD in it. Uh, but I used Blade Logic uh, when I was at uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and it was great and powerful for, like I said, very heterogeneous backends and different infrastructures and putting policy uh, for configuration management across multiple OSs and across multiple versions of OSs. But that ought to be a dying art, as I mentioned. Uh, next up, the practice of configuration management. Uh, so push or pull approach is a choice. Um, zero day provisioning, uh, like I said, Terraform, asset primitiv primitives, and then you hand it over to configuration management. Uh, and then day one provisioning, right, where you become a specific instance of an app or a specific instance uh, for a particular environment. So I like to think, and maybe I've mentioned this before, but it's probably bearing 
bears mentioning again, is that uh, Terraform will give you a bunch of raw compute, right? The basic assets of storage, memory, network, um, and uh, um, CPU. Uh, the, uh, the, what you're gonna do with it, is it gonna become a front-end web server in dev? Uh, is it gonna become um, a middleware, you know, um, application layer um, server in QA? Uh, or is it gonna become a production database, right? Um, uh, on the back end, uh, that's what is sort of the relay race, right? Terraform gives you your asset primitives and then in comes configuration management to turn it into a particular instance of a particular app or application stack for a particular environment. And that's where you put all of the variables into your Ansible or configuration management tool to decide, you know, what network range is used for production databases, what network range is used for storage, you know, um, and S3 buckets, you know, for other environments. Uh, so that's more of my, my way of um, dividing, you know, the line and responsibilities between what I call day zero provisioning and day one provisioning. All right, so now let's talk about asset management for a little bit. Um, CMDB, right, the configuration management database. Um, this, a CMDB contains information on hardware, on software. Uh, it's, uh, it's used uh, as part of uh, impact assessment for change control. Uh, and uh, it's critical to have a CMDB for vulnerability management. Um, what, you know, does this particular vulnerability apply to us? Well, you need to know if you're running that particular software that the CVE applies to. Uh, and of course, incident response, uh, as well as discovery scanning and services uh, are quite uh, dependent uh, and ought to be populating uh, the contents of a CMDB. And of course, applications, uh, authenticated application scanning, um, IPAM, uh, IP address management, uh, these are all necessary for CI CD and for automated deployment of infrastructure and Terraform. Uh, you can't, you know, have to go to the networking team and say, hey, I need an IP address for a new server. And then they open up a spreadsheet in, you know, Excel and look through the network ranges and figure out what address isn't being used yet. And then, you know, put it in a ticket or tell you in an email, okay, you can use this address. Uh, that is certainly not automated. Uh, you definitely want an IPAM solution and a CMDB that knows what um, IP addresses have been handed out to what devices, what ranges are being used, you know, for your containers, you know, for various application stacks in different data centers and in different uh, environments. Uh, asset management is the ability to know who has what devices, what they are, what software is installed on them, and what configurations have been applied. Uh, this includes all kinds of devices from network devices to mobile phones, tablets, laptops, computers, and everything in between. Good asset management is key to good information security. Whether it's vulnerability management and being able to say with confidence that a particular piece of software is or is not used on your platform, uh, or for incident response to know the impact of an alert or an incident. Uh, shown here uh, is a photo I took of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, uh, which they call their visible, visible storage artifacts. Uh, so they have plenty of um, different types of, of glass plates and uh, um, you know, uh, candle holders and uh, cigarette you know, smoking dishes and mugs and wine glasses. And rather than keep these all locked away where no one can see them, uh, they thought it would be interesting. And I think it was interesting uh, that they created visible storage. So these items are in storage. And for me, this is kind of uh, embodies you know, what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about uh, asset management. All right, uh, let's see. So next up, a little bit more about asset management and configuration management. So a configuration management database is an ITIL database used by an organization to store information about hardware and software assets. Uh, configuration items, uh, abbreviated as CIs. Um, so ServiceNow, for example, is a quite popular uh, CMDB uh, that uses also these ITIL terms of, of CIs. Um, a data warehouse for the organization. It also stores information regarding the relationships uh, among its assets um, and provides a means of understanding the organization's critical assets and their relationships, such as upstream and downstream dependencies. So why is this important? Um, well, if somebody's gonna do a maintenance on a, a network switch and you need to know what's connected to that network switch and you need to know uh, whether any teams need to be told that there'll be an interruption potentially uh, of that if uh, it's in an environment that doesn't have fault tolerant, auto failover of multiple switches and multiple pathing for network routers and switching uh, traffic. 
uh, you need to know who's plugged into that switch and what apps are there or what storage devices will be impacted. And so basically it's um, a dependency map of assets. And so you can link them as upstream or downstream and dependent uh, and having these relationships in a, a well-organized uh, CMDB. Uh, another aspect of asset management that I mentioned um, was IPAM. So IP address management is a methodology for implementing in computer software for planning and managing the assignment and use of IP addresses and closely related resources of a computer network. Uh, so here I'm just looking at what some of the dotted quad um, notation used for um, IP addresses in this uh, visual. And let's see. Um, asset management code and artifacts. Yeah, so we can definitely uh, spend some time looking at uh, code and artifacts uh, as a part of asset management, right? A software repository. Um, in this case, I'm talking about Git, um, but prior to Git, people used to use uh, Subversion. Uh, prior to Subversion, they used to use something called um, RCS or SCCS. Um, these are just different ways of storing you know, code and maintaining versions and tracking notes and history as to who changed what and why. Um, a software repository or repo for short is where you keep your software packages and your code. Uh, usually a table of components is stored as well as metadata and repositories contain groups of packages. Often the uncompiled code and the compiled artifacts are actually stored separately. And that's, I think the term artifact um, or artifactory uh, is where you put the compiled binaries for certain code uh, and you deploy those and you keep the uncompiled code, uh, which is used for code scanning and analysis and dependency in a separate repo. Um, some of them do converge though. Um, I've worked in uh, companies where we just had all of the above uh, in one repo, and we just separated it out under different folders uh, for the artifacts and for the build artifacts that actually get pushed out. All right, so I think I made it pretty quickly through um, that set of slides because we are now on to InfoSec in the news. Maybe I told a couple of um, less anecdotes this time around, um, but that leaves us with you know at least um, a half an hour or more to do uh, some of the infosec in the news. And there's been some really interesting news uh, lately that we should look into uh, with regard to um, Excellion, if you've heard about that or not, or if you saw that thread. So let me switch over uh, to uh, full screen and then jump over to our Slack channel and not be looking at work, but instead be looking at Tandon. All right. Um, yeah, here we go. So reverse time order, um, looking at events. Actually, before I do that, uh, let me do pull up the um, a tab here and uh, look at Excellion, because this was something that was uh, interesting in the news. Um, they have a file transfer appliance that has been around for like 20 years and it's been hacked uh, recently. Uh, so I think, let me just fix the lighting here. Looks like we're getting too bright now that the sun's gone down. Uh, that's probably a little better, maybe a little better white balance. So it looks so red. Anyway, um, so Excellion, uh, large file transfer, where was there? Yeah, here's their update. Um, so secure file transfer, uh, ways of using a web page, you know, to transfer large files, um, doing it in a secure fashion rather than emailing it or putting it on a file server without knowing who's logging in and downloading it. Uh, so basically they had um, this press release on February 1st um, that their enterprise content firewall, they call it FTA, file transfer um, appliance, uh, was a 20 year old product nearing end of life and it was targeted for an attack. Uh, there was basically, I think what cross site scripting and SQL injection vulnerabilities on it. And some researchers found those uh, in 2015. And I think some of them cropped up again last December. Uh, so basically, they were a target of an attack and they notified their customers on December 23rd. Uh, so that, you know, fills in some of the theme that we were talking about previously about um, having your notifications ready to go ahead of time and owning the narrative. Um, but this one's going to unroll uh, pretty in a pretty ugly way because there were a lot of customers using this and they shouldn't have been using an end of life tool. And Excellion has accelerated 
uh, the retirement of this. So you can no longer buy and renew um, the software. Um, but it had these vulnerabilities, which meant that people could steal data. And there were a lot of significant entities using Excellion for secure file transfers with lots and lots of sensitive data. So I think the, um, what was it, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand uh, blamed uh, Excellion for a breach that they had. Um, who are some of the other ones? I think we can find those news stories. Um, but anyway, so they, they claim to have notified everyone in December 23rd that they patched all the vulnerabilities, but some more popped up in, in January as well. And, uh, uh, concerted, they called it concerted cyber attack um, of the FTA product continued into January and additional exploits in the ensuing weeks. Um, they released patches to close the vulnerability, um, but there's certainly a lot of um, cows that have left the barn, as they say, right, where the data was stolen. And there's going to be a whole bunch of breach notifications coming from hundreds of um, Excellion customers in the coming days and weeks as they figure out, you know, what was um, stolen and uh, who was uh, impacted. <clears throat> so uh, let's see, what else? In 21, every security provider must not only demonstrate secure software architecture, but also proficient at cyber warfare. Uh, Excellion is uniformly committed to protecting blah, blah, blah. In regard to this incident, they're contacting an industry leading cybersecurity forensics firm to conduct a compromise assessment and will share their findings when available. Uh, so anyway, that's your typical press release that you have to put out when your company had a product that was trusted and used and um, got uh, broken and abused uh, by. They have a new solution called KiteWorks, uh, and they want everyone to cut over to it, right? So can you imagine how bad you would be if you had never decided to come up with a new product, right? And you just kept milking that 20-year-old FTA appliance and cow and you had nothing to switch people over to then you would be in a really business continuity threat uh, existential threat kind of position um, but they do have um, kite works ready to go and it doesn't suffer from these same exploits uh, so what else do we know about um, the excellion incident um, there's a couple of press releases about it um, yeah. let's see what some of those are um, Excellion, Global News, um, yeah, what went wrong? Bank Info Security. This one was a good story that I was researching uh, for our organization. Uh, we don't make use of Excellion, um, but anyone that does hmm, ought to be looking uh, closely at this. So this was the story about the Reserve Bank of New Zealand being impacted. Um, it's not a straightforward story. A little bit of the risk lives, you know, uh, and the onus is on Excellion, but also on people that were using, you know, an ancient tool like this. And what did it say? Um, let's see, Excellion prides itself on secure file sharing. So the appliance, given its age and wide use, was a juicy target. Over the last seven weeks or so, several SQL and other vulnerabilities have emerged in the product. Uh, Joel York, Excellion's chief marketing officer, tells me that a recent external audit of FTA found no problems and claimed that the vulnerabilities were hard to find. I would have to take issue with that because you know SQL injection, cross-site scripting type vulnerabilities are not hard to find, um, and uh, this is just you know marketing speak. People have to you know say that it was you know, very surprising that they got hacked, right? Um, but anyway, he said he likened their situation with that of Fire and Microsoft and the Solar Winds incident, which was a supply chain hack. Uh, this one is just a vulnerability in the software. So some people, I think. Fair enough, make an analogy, say this is a mini solar winds because it's not 18,000 companies that got impacted by an APT. Uh, and we don't know if it's the same advanced uh, persistent threat, AP to, APT 29, that's behind this hack, uh, Cozy Bear uh, out of Russia. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, it's going to draw you know, conclusions uh, and references in the press and in media. Uh, we don't miss much. Right? We have a very thorough process, he said. But of course, they did miss a bunch of SQL injection vulnerabilities in an aging product. Uh, so it said in mid-December, they patched the SQL injection vulnerability and privately notified its customers. Um, Australian security podcast Risky.biz writes that the issues include a SQL injection flaw in the FTA web interface, cross-site scripting flaw in its file manager, and a blind SQL injection and command injection flaw in the administrative interface, uh, an unauthorized upload vulnerability. And then on Monday, a new victim came forward. Uh, the Washington State Auditor's Office said that several 
uh, sorry, that personal information relating to 1.6 million unemployment can, claims um, on its FTA uh, may have been exposed. And so they have their breach um, announcement linked here as well. Uh, we can pull that up because that's useful again to understand what is people, what are the various people's roles uh, in an unfolding event like this, and you know the system failed, um, and this was uh, what a forced error, right? This didn't happen accidentally. Uh, this happened due to malicious attack and abuse of vulnerabilities. Uh, until Washington's announcement, Excelling's problems had stayed in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand was the first organization to come forward, Jan 11, about a breach tied to it, um, and uh, as well as uh, an Australian law firm. Uh, let's see, following New Zealand's disclosure, they estimated that it was less than 50 customers that were affected. Uh, but now I believe there's good reason to think that it's uh, over 100, 140 customers, um, and the number is growing. Uh, and of course, even York, you know, the marketing person said that figure could be in flux now which is a nice way of saying, yeah, it's bigger than 50. Um, web searches turn up facing, you know, uh, many public facing portals that are still using FTA. And of course, that's what everyone's doing right now is trying to figure out what is the impact, you know, who was using which version of their software. Uh, let's see, although um, there's much that he can't comment on, and this is proper media training, even if he could comment on it, he shouldn't. Um, he did provide some background on what they've faced. And again, the first vulnerability was patched in December. Essentially, it's been um, sort of warfare going back between them patching and then getting hacked again in new ways and them patching, right? It's a response cat and mouse game. The disclosure of vulnerability findings often lead to um, the findings of related vulnerabilities. And this is a bit of the 12 stages, of, or not 12, the five stages of grief that people go through uh, when they're told you know, something that they don't want to believe, which is that they've been hacked and that they're vulnerable. A lot of times companies will lash out and, and say, well, as you vulnerability researchers, you, know, you showed them how to hack us. And of course, even if they're doing this responsible disclosure, uh, the fact that they're hacked and vulnerable, you know, you, you can't blame, you know, the researchers because uh, they're doing, you know, the right thing, which is find the vulnerability, communicate it to the vendor privately, and then if, if nothing happens and it's not pick, fixed or patched, you know, within a given amount of time, then they have the right to come forward um, and potentially, you know, make claims for bug bounties if it's been fixed and get paid. Uh, but in general, they want to protect and aware, make people aware of the risk. Uh, so let's see, New York says Excellion has a trained forensics firm to figure out what went wrong. <coughs> could be FireEye, could be um, CrowdStrike, it could be Dell SecureWorks. There's plenty of forensics agencies that get pulled in to help do this. Your lesson for wherever you may find yourself working in the future in InfoSec um, is that there are situations where even if you have the in-house talent to do the work, uh, you want to engage an outside third party uh, for reasons of um, you know, legal reasons. So you need outside counsel and an outside forensics um, entity. Because if you're researching your own incident, number one, people don't always trust that you're going to be as forthgoing um, as an independent third party. And number two, um, what is it? Uh, attorney client privilege uh, is, is very difficult to maintain uh, if you're not using outside counsel. Outside counsel can put, you know, just attorney client privilege across the email, across the, the files and reports and the messages, and they don't have to disclose it. But if you're running your own incident and your own incident response, um, anyone that's uh, a claimant, right? Uh, anyone that's been impacted by it, and there will be many uh, that'll be filing lawsuits for this. They have a right to what's called discovery and they can file a discovery request and say, okay, give us the log files. Give us the audit logs of your servers, you know, that were hacked and you have to give it to them. Uh, but if you engage a third party, you have a buffer uh, and you can give it to that third party and they can review it in escrow, but it doesn't have to be disclosed you know, to people that can then use that data against you and bring a larger suit and more damages against your company. Um, so this is self-preservation at work, essentially. Uh, let's see, given the danger of using all software, why haven't the customers moved? And they say, well, we've been trying to get them to move for years, you know, but it was making money and it didn't require any investment because they hadn't been doing security updates apparently, right? To patch vulnerabilities and do good testing against it. I mean, it was a 20 year old, you know, tool. Um, who knows what's under the hood in there? Uh, but I'm sure we'll find out in the coming days. Let's see, communication issues. Um, there also appears to have been some comms problems involved. So Washington State is alleging that it wasn't informed of the vulnerabilities that led to the suspected breach. Um, York, however, says that they aggressively reached out to customers, um, but maybe they sent emails to addresses of people that weren't there anymore. And so this commonly happens, right? Um, contact management 
it's not always kept up to date. Uh, if you bought, you know, um, a tool and, you know, the person that's in procurement, you know, moves on and you didn't use a service account, you know, that then sends to a distribution list of recipients um, saying, hey, there's been, you know, what if, what if um, Washington really did get the email, but it went to, you know, an empty box or, you know, um, an unread mailbox? Who's to blame for that? Uh, I think both, actually. I would think that um, Excellion should have active acknowledgement of receipt of a breach of notification of this. And if someone didn't actively acknowledge saying, hey, I got their message and we're working on it, they should continue to reach out to them. And of course, they said they aggressively tried to reach out, but who knows, you know, for your mileage may vary um, some degrees of aggressive, you know, follow up, right? Obviously, they take the security of their client very, very seriously. No one would ever not say any sentence like that. Um, and then one week after New Zealand's breach, the bank's governor said he personally owned the breach and felt that they didn't patch it uh, in time. Uh, and so that's, you know, awesome, right? Uh, New Zealanders, I think, are really quite honest and forthright and, and trusting and trust uh, worthy uh, for their transparency and having the, you know, Reserve Bank uh, uh, say that he feels partially responsible for what happened because maybe they didn't patch um, uh, when they were notified. And let's see, let's take a look at that statement actually. Uh, Reserve Bank Governor says he owns the breach. Uh, the Governor of New Zealand's Reserve Bank, the Nation Central Bank said he personally owns responsibility for the data breach <coughs> that exposed private and sensitive stakeholder information. Uh, the bank's actions have fallen short on the public's expectations, which I am un unreservedly apologizing. And he had a video and a statement. <coughs> The bank disclosed on Jan 10 that hackers had compromised the bank's file transfer appliance from Excellion, <coughs> a Palo Alto based company. Um, he said that that raises serious questions over why it occurred and how to better secure them. Um, affected stakeholders have been contacted, but the details of the data access can't be released because that might affect the investigation and future defensive steps. Um, this is a complex process legacy appliance and the flaw or didn't go into detail about how the breach occurred, but information released by Excellion provides a picture of what went wrong. Um, Excellion released a statement saying that it warned customers of what it termed a P0 vulnerability. So P is for priority and priority one would be as high as it goes, unless of course you're like, oh God, we never thought of a vulnerability that's even more <coughs> impactful and, and dangerous. So let's call it a P0, right? <clears throat> like a zero day um, vulnerability. Uh, so P0 to denotes something even higher than a P1. And a P2, P3, you know, they have certain SLAs for getting back to you and remediating it and things like that. Um, Excellion re resolved it and released a patch within 72 hours for the 50 customers. The company said one plausible scenario is they didn't patch the flaw before hackers managed to access the data. Or it all happened before the December 23rd notification and it's all water under the bridge. Um, but that's why it's important to have log files uh, to prove what happened uh, and when. Uh, but what's interesting is that, and I was doing some reading up on this um, before I talk about KiteWorks and their new tool, um, which launched, I think, seven years ago. Um, anyway, the one of the vulnerabilities that was uh, disclosed that you can read about on the um, Excellium FTA back in 2015, 2016, was that the um, exploit had been demonstrated to create a web shell, right? Which is a way of putting a file up on you know, a web instance, like a secure file transfer uh, website and um, allowing remote access through that web shell, right? So it's like creating a remote access um, uh, Trojan or you know, persistent uh, remote access after uh, some type of vulnerability hacks you into the system, you wanna get, be able to get back into the system again later. And so it was publishing it under a URL called slash about.html. And so the presence of this URL indicates, you know, uh, is an indication of compromise. And normally you could look in the log files <clears throat> of your secure file transfer appliance and you'd say, did anyone access, you know, slash about because there was no page part of the package for the file transfer appliance. And it's a very innocuous sounding web page, right? It's an about page. Uh, but anyway, you'd be able to look through the log files to see if anyone had actually actively exploited and installed a web shell on your instance, right? You're the security officer, you're working on an investigation, uh, you're working on an incident response, you know, and um, threat response, you're working with the IS and IT teams. So you pull the log files from that Excellion appliance. 
but the attackers were particularly crafty and clever. And they actually had uh, a tool built into this exploit, into this web shell, uh, which would, because it knew exactly where these log files are, uh, it would actually strip out its own access requests to the about URL from those access logs and rewrite them. And so there would be no evidence on the tool that you had been exploited because uh, they're covering their tracks. And a lot of malware does this, right? But this was particularly clever. Uh, the only way you could mitigate that is if you had configured your secure uh, file transfer appliance to remotely send its log files off to a third, um, you know, uh, or an independent server, a, a remote syslog host is, is what it's often called, uh, so that they couldn't be tampered with. Because uh, this is a, a fundamental, you know, um, architectural uh, solution that should be a part of, of trusted, you know, systems with sensitive data, is that you can't trust that the system won't be tampered with by administrators or by hackers. And so you don't want someone going in and covering their tracks just because they're an administrator and deleting the log files or deleting signs, you know, that they did something like stealing credit card numbers or something like that, right? If you're in a payment gateway provider, uh, these insider threats um, have to be dealt with through the same type of mitigation, which is that you send those log file events off in real time to a very, very locked down secure syslog server. And that way the bad guys would have to compromise that host as well in order to delete that copy of the logs that showed that the about URL had been accessed. Uh, so anyway, that's one bit of drill down on this one uh, that I think plays into today's architecture uh, discussion and uh, reference architecture designs. Uh, make sure you set up a secure syslogger and you don't always trust the log files that live on the hosts themselves because when the host is compromised, the bad guys like to delete their tracks. Um, this could also tie into having cloud-based solutions for log aggregation. Uh, that's essentially sometimes the same as a, a remote syslogger. Um, but anyway, that's the construction for an on-prem design. And an equivalent uh, can be built into uh, the same. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, in 2017, NCC Group published an advisory against several vulnerabilities in FTA. <clears throat> NCC Group found that an unauthenticated attackers can execute arbitrary, arbitrary code on the Excelium fire transfer appliances with web user privileges. And that's what I was just describing, right? The web shell uh, technique uh, to remotely wipe you know, logs and show signs that they had been there after they've stolen what they wanted um, or install you know, persistent remote access techniques uh, like a web shell. All right, so that's uh, a little bit about our friends uh, in New Zealand. Uh, let's see, what did uh, we hear about uh, Washington State? Um, Washington State Auditor Pat McCarthy says her office was not notified about the vulnerability. Well, the data breach, I think it went up, right, from 1.4 million pandemic claimants records uh, involved a flaw. Let's see, organizations, same news. Hackers took advantage of the vulnerability to access files that included uh, personally identifiable information, who filed unemployment insurance claims last year. So what would you do with this information? Right? Let's say you're an attacker and you just took over the Washington State auditors. You got 1.5 million records. What kind of scams could you put together? Well, social security claims, um, unemployment insurance claims. You could uh, redirect funds uh, for direct deposit that may be set up uh, for these users uh, to your accounts um, and shielding them through you know, other bank account routing and forwarding typical money laundering type techniques. Uh, compromised data includes social security numbers, driver's license numbers, uh, state identification numbers, bank account numbers, routing numbers, places of employment. So you can do a really good you know, um, hack against these people. And so I think um, there'll be a big case uh, uh, against um, Excelion coming from, uh, from the state of Washington. Uh, let's see, noted that the data was exposed and collected as part of an investigation into how the state employment department lost 600 million to fraudulent unemployment claims in 2020. So not only was it unemployment claims, but it was unemployment claims that had been already mingled and mixed up in uh, fraudulent uh, claims. Uh, so even more ripe uh, target uh, for bad actors whether that's nation states trying to fund, you know, their activities, or if it's just, you know, sort of run of the mill um, mafia and uh, crime, uh, big, you know, organized crime types. Uh, let's see what else, supply chain risk. <clears throat> Obviously, this is something that I know a lot about because I work for a company that helps maintain uh, awareness uh, and tools to help people discover their um, supply chain risks and third party risks. 
Um, I think there was even a Wall Street Journal article recently that mentioned uh, Security Scorecard by name as one of the tools uh, that can help um, avoid these things uh, happening in the future uh, if more people were to use them. So we appreciate uh, the author of that uh, Wall Street Journal article giving us that uh, call out. Uh, and then here's the FTA obituary. Um, George Tsai and Qualys found those vulnerabilities in 2016 for cross-site scripting and SQL injection. Uh, and the web shell, yeah. Here was the analysis of the web shell in case you wanted to check it out uh, that I had described. Um, let me throw this into the chat um, briefly just to record it for posterity. Um, the same kind of attack has to have been the same kind of thing uh, that was uh, being used uh, by the bad guys uh, against the software. Um, vendor Excelium. So anyway, that's some good detail. And here's that about page that I was talking about and how it erased its tracks and everything. Definitely a good story to read up on and to be familiar with. Someone may ask you about it in an interview, right? If you're taking an interview and someone wants to understand, you know, what happened with Excelium and how would you explain it to your mother? Uh, how would you talk about, you know, the supply chain risk and things like that? All right, so let's jump back into the latest news. So Microsoft Edge is crowdsourcing whether to show notification prompts. Uh, so it looks like they're doing A-B testing, right? And asking people, you know, how many notifications is too many notifications? How many prompts, um, you know, makes you um, uh, desensitized, right? To notifications saying, hey, this is unsafe. Hey, this is unsafe. And if everyone just keeps giving, okay, 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 uh, that's not good either, right? So I presume this story is about using uh, whether or not to show, you know, some particular dialogues um, based on crowdsourcing, which is good, right? They're outsourcing uh, the usability and functions uh, to the users. Uh, let's see, tracking cryptocurrency malware in the home lab, not for this topic. Kroger data breach exposes pharmacy employee data. Uh, let's look at this from an architectural point of view <clears throat> and see if we can figure out what they did wrong, if anything, uh, in their architecture that exposed uh, due to this breach. Uh, so supermarket Kroger suffered a data breach um, after a service used to file transfers. Oh, this looks like a total knock-on uh, for the uh, Excelium, uh, doesn't it? Um, so let's see, Kroger, approximately 500,000 people. Uh, yep, Excelium FTA. So this is another one. Kroger disclosed that they were the latest company to be affected by a security vulnerability in FTA. Um, according to the data breach advisory published yesterday, Kroger was informed on January 23rd, immediately discontinued the services use. Um, so let me pause the share here for a second and jump over to a hand prompt and just do a quick query of uh, Kroger DNS like we did before and see what we learn. Let's see, resume, share, back to the thing. Um, so we're saying Python 3, sublister, sublister. And I'm pretty sure it's Kroger.com, right? Uh, yeah, Kroger, looks like they have uh, Kroger.com. And using this, I'm going to say domain name Kroger.com. This is going to enumerate the DNS entries as well as historical DNS, entry, DNS entries for Kroger. I'll put it into a file called Kroger.com.txt, and we can essentially look inside of it for signs of an Excelian, you know, or a secure file transfer reference, and we can know what um, endpoint of theirs had been breached. Um, so let's word count that uh, Kroger file. Oh, looks like 714 entries. Let's look for um, Excelion in Kroger. Uh, no, that's a certify. Um, what else would be a potential name for it? Um, SFT. Yep, there you go. Secure file transfer. Curl dash I K, and we look up and see if it's there. Connection refused. Yeah, so it looks like they brought it down. Um, they probably have um, 
some other instances maybe as well. Maybe these are not Excelian. And again, not all of these DNS entries are live, so we can't be sure if this one's around. Uh, these are likely load balancer pool member names, right? SF, SFDP01.kroger.com doesn't look like it's answering either. Um, we can try SSHing to it as well. This might not be the Excelian appliance, right? This could be something else, yeah. So this one did reply. And what do we know about it? Um, let's see. So this is my client stuff, right? Uh, I'm doing SSH uh, via verbose. Um, so my client is OpenSSH and Libra SSL is the library. Um, but what do we get on their side? Um, we get remote protocol version two, which is SSH or SCP protocol two, which is the secure version. And the remote software version is um, Tectia server. And it tells us the exact version. Um, so we're not sure what to do with that, but then it tries to authenticate as me and it says, okay, well, do you have a key and do you want to store it and everything? So anyway, so Kroger came back and told us, you know, that they're using a Tectia server. So that's probably not um, the FTA one. Uh, S uh, secure. So they have at least something available, right, for this Tectia. So it looks like um, Tectia might be part of... Uh, Who makes Tectia? Uh, secure shell, secure shell, secure shell. Um, Tectia client, Carnegie Mellon. So maybe it's an open source um, tool. Um, I haven't seen that one before. But anyway, so it looks like Kroger brought down um, the uh, SFT. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can use the Wayback Machine to figure out what URLs um, the, the archive.org has for it. Uh, so if I do this, if I say um, Kroger.txt and I put in sft.kroger.txt, that was the host name if I remember correctly. Yeah, sft.kroger.com is the one that's not responding anymore that the press release said they brought down. Uh, we can use the Wayback Machine to see what was learned about it. So you can actually find artifacts about things that have been turned off. So if I go and I say, how does this work? Um, cat Kroger text, pipe it through go bin Wayback URLs, which is an open source project that basically has an API query. Um, so I don't have to go to the Wayback Machine to look for URLs for host. Uh, and then we put down krogerurls.txt, cat krogerurls.txt, and oof, that was uh, not what I expected. Um, what the heck is going on there? Um, Let's try this again. So cat, oh, I know, I didn't uh, pipe it, that's why. Cat that through that and write it out as that. Now if I look at the Kroger URL. Um, these are the URLs that came out uh, from the Wayback Machine. And having researched this, I know that this is the login URL for the secure file transfer appliance uh, for um, uh, for Excelion um, because you can look in their manual, right? Um, and you can look in their API documentation for the login URL. And so anything slash courier, um, it's nice to see that courier slash about.html didn't show up because that means that they had the uh, exploit from 2016, 2017 recorded as a valid you know, uh, entry point. Uh, for them and to, they may have been hacked in the past but anyway this is one way of confirming even though they shut it down uh, that they used to operate um, the fta appliance um, and if you want to see one of the kite works examples um, i know that the sec is using excelium but they're using the kite works example um, so they have curl um, dash i uh, hps 
sft.se. No, they call it WFT, I think, wft.sec.gov. And if you query for slash rest slash, uh, that's one of the URLs for the KiteWorks instances. And the reason I found this out was because it comes back with a header that says X Excelium location. So basically it's saying, you know, I can't find what you're looking for, a 404. Uh, we know it's using an Nginx instance. So KiteWorks is based on Nginx, but it doesn't disclose what version, which is good security hygiene. Um, but it, this header does disclose that they're running Excelium. And it says the URL you really wanted was the REST API here without the slash on the end, because you're going to be passing arguments to it. I don't know what those arguments should be because uh, I didn't research it that much, you know, to try to um, probe, you know, the uh, REST interface for this. Um, but the other thing is that the um, administrators created a cookie on their F5 load balancer and they called it big IP server WFT, which is web file transfer, uh, which was the host name, um, Excelion pool. And then we're getting a cookie. And so that it's doing what I was talking about before, right? Um, uh, sticky sessions. It's keeping my file transfer connection, if I were to initiate one, on the same node on the back end. So basically, this tells me that the, um, the Security and Exchange Commission is using Excelium. They've got it behind an F5, so it's load balanced, highly available, uh, and it's running the KiteWorks version because it has this Excelium her server that said, no, no, the rest URL you want is actually here. All right. So again, information disclosure, um, lots of um, technique and, and years of experience, I guess, to kind of find this stuff and dig it up, you know, so quickly, um, like I did um, when this happened. Um, but anyway, I thought I would share a little bit of that with you from my own investigations into how to confirm or deny whether someone was running something. You find the press release, they say they turned it off, but you can still find signs of it, you know, using the archive.org and the Wayback Machine. So anyway, that Kroger um, is just another one of the instances that uh, people have to worry about uh, given the hack. Uh, so let's jump back into the news. Um, Brazilian firm failed to increase security spend through COVID. Um, the majority of companies invest 10% or less uh, of their IT budget in that area. Not today's topic. Um, Experian challenged over massive data leak in Brazil. Uh, interesting. Consumer rights body criticizes explanations from the credit bureau in relation to the data exposure of 220 million citizens. So this is basically what, uh, same size as the uh, um, Equifax breach that happened in the US, right? I um, don't know how many million Brazilians there are, but this is a lot of them. Uh, let's see. So after receiving feedback from Experian, uh, over a massive data leak, the state consumer rights um, described the company's explanations as insufficient. Uh, no hypothesis has been ruled out. At the moment, we consider it more likely that the leak came from inside companies rather than hackers. Um, experience feedback uh, prompts more questions than answers. I wonder if they gave uh, any details of what that feedback was here. The agency's demands for answers follow calls from the Brazilian Institute for Consumer Protection to for urgent measures to investigate and punish those responsible for exposing the population's data, as well as improve citizen information and transparency. Um, so to me, that seems like a natural and good outcome from a breach and that they should go and make sure that Experian doesn't get off the hook um, uh, very easily uh, for having been involved in a huge um, breach. Um, and the uh, lighting just keeps changing on me. I can't really get enough white balance out of this, can I? To... Oh, wait, that's a little bit more human looking face. Okay. Anyway, um, what else? Um, here we have a bleeping computer, sonic wall updates to a vulnerability. No, that's not really an architecture discussion. Privacy bug in Brave browser exposes dark web browsing history of its users. Um, okay, that's interesting. Uh, architectural? No, not really, but an interesting story. Um, they fixed a privacy issue in its browser that sent queries for Onion domains to public DNS. So .onion is um, torrents uh, and Onion browsers uh, that uh, preserve your anonymity. And people obviously that are using them don't want you know their DNS queries going to public resolvers because then you can tell who's asking right the DNS query for these um, these Tor nodes, and so it's basically exposing their dark web visit. Uh, so that's certainly uh, you know a, a freak out um, for people that like to browse the dark web with torrent browsers uh, and onion browsers they're called. Um, let's see what else. New hack lets attackers bypass Mastercard PIN by using them as a Visa card. That's bizarre. Um, 
Cybersecurity research has disclosed a novel attack that could allow criminals to trick a point of sale terminal into transacting with the victim's MasterCard contactless card while believing it to be a Visa card. That's bizarre. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of uh, class. Um, I guess we could think about architectural mitigations to this attack. So let's uh, walk through it. Uh, new hack lets attackers bypass them. Cybersecurity research have disclosed a novel attack that could allow criminals to trick. That's okay, we read that already. The research published by a group of academics uh, in Zurich builds on a study detailed last September that delved into a pin bypass attack, permitting bad actors to leverage a, leverage a victim's stolen or lost Visa EMV enabled card for making high value purchases without knowledge of the card's pin and even fool the terminal into accepting inauthentic offline card transactions. This is just not a mere card brand mix up, but it has critical consequences. Uh, for example, criminals can use it in combination with the previous attacks uh, on Visa to also bypass the pin for MasterCard. The, the cards of this brand were previously presumed protected by pin. Card brand mix up attack. Just like the previous attack involving Visa cards, the latest research to exploit serious vulnerabilities in the widely used EMV contactless protocol. Um, only this time, the target is MasterCard. Um, at a high level, it's achieved using the Android application that implements a man in the middle attack to stop a relay attack architecture, thereby, oh, atop a relay attack architecture, thereby allowing the app to not only initiate messages between the two endpoints, the terminal and the card, but also to intercept and manipulate the NFC, uh, near field communications is called, contactless. Uh, or Wi-Fi communications to maliciously produce a mismatch between the card brand and the payment network. Um, so I suppose someone could drop a point of sale emulator near the card and do a man in the middle attack. That makes sense. Um, so here's the thing that you think you're doing contactless with. And let's say they put this you know, thing that they're doing under the table or something, right, surreptitiously. So I guess the architectural mitigation for this is to use to not use contactless uh, until these particular protocol weaknesses of EMV contactless uh, have been um, have been have been dealt with. And so if you're a store owner and you're or you're running a POS point of sale, um, you know, uh, company that does security uh, that you would temporarily disable uh, contactless and ask people to use contact. Um, uh, and actually insert the card because inserting the card can't be man in the middle unless you have a swiper right or a skimmer uh, like they do for atm cards um, so anyway everything has its weaknesses um, but this one may have to you know change people's behaviors for a while until it can be uh, dealt with so what is this uh, detail here it says um the payment terminal recognizes the brand using a combination of what's called a primary account number pan also as the card number, right? The first couple of digits of a credit card or PIN card tell you, you know, whether it's MasterCard, you know, American Express, Visa, everyone knows that. That's not information that's uh, hard to get at. Uh, uniquely identifies the card, right? Uh, subsequent uh, makes use of the latter to activate a specific kernel for the transaction. Uh, the EMV kernel is a set of function that provides all the necessary processing logic and data that is required to perform an EMV contact or contactless transaction. The attack dubbed card brand mixup takes advantage of the fact that these aids are not authenticated to the payment terminal, thus making it possible to deceive a terminal into activating a flawed kernel and by extension the bank that processes payments on behalf of the merchant into accepting contactless transactions with a pan and an aid that indicate different card brands. Um, so yeah, mm, not, not good. Um, certainly uh, makes them look like they didn't do very good QA on this. Um, let's see, MasterCard adds countermeasures. That sounds good. Using the POC Android app, the Zurich researchers said they're able to bypass pin verification for transactions, including two Maestro debit and two MasterCard cards, all issued by different banks and one with transactions exceeding $400. In response to the findings, MasterCard has added a number of countermeasures, including mandated financial institutions to include the AID in the authorization data, allowing card issuers to check the AID against the PAN. Well, that's interesting because then MasterCard can say that they've said, hey, you're going to have to send us the details that we never asked you for before. That doesn't mean they fixed anything, right? People have to then implement and roll out all of these checks and software, right? And so it'll be a while because this payment 
and gateway provider stuff, you know, takes um, years sometimes to roll out to, you know, all uh, point of sale um, providers and uh, implementations of software that use these card readers, you know, uh, for near field communication and contactless payments. Uh, additionally, the payment network has rolled out checks for other data points present in the authorization request that could be used to identify an attack of this kind, thereby declining. Uh, so obviously, you know, to me, it sounds like they're implementing tools and checks that they should have always been implementing, right? Uh, you want multiple uh, points of telemetry to verify and identify fraudulent um, you know, data. Um, it could be that some identifier on the you know, PAN uh, or the AID um, is just being used and reused, right? People are just copying and cloning because they know it's not being checked. Uh, they could have been checking this previously. And so anyway, so they've responded and they act responsible. Uh, but in a way, this was a weak system and it just took someone, you know, uh, to cause a system failure, a forced failure by attacking it and understanding how it worked. And this was some um, security researchers doing it. I'm not sure, you know, how long ago the bad guys were clued in to do this. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a certain degree of um, fraud that's present, you know, across the entire system of credit cards and debit cards and payment cards. And they often call it uh, shrinkage, you know, in terms of retail, right? How much stuff gets stolen from a, uh, uh, um, a, a retail store in, in person. But anyway, so these kinds of attacks are interesting and, and uh, informative, uh, illustrative for us to understand some of the principles of good security engineering, good security design, and, uh, you know, making a trustworthy system. All right, so that takes us to 601. I think I started a minute or so late, um, but thanks for joining week four. It's been uh, fun for me to go through the slides and share these stories and information with you. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and I'll post a link uh, into Slack and uh, NYU classes uh, with the, the link to the recording for those of you that weren't here for it today. And uh, what else? Uh, your student projects. I'll be looking for that email and getting back and grading some more of the assignments uh, over the weekend uh, and into the early part of next week. But basically, I should have a proposal from each of you and I'll be reviewing them uh, since this is now the beginning of week four. Um, and so that's when I'll be approving your uh, proposals. So thanks a lot uh, for joining and we'll see you next week.